We are not men disguised as mere dogs. We are wolves disguised as men. Captain Muroto, Jinro, the wolf brigade they say, evil prevails when good men fail to act. What they ought to say is, evil prevails Yuri or love, Lord of War TSSSSSSSS. OSSS. SSS. SSSS death. Hug father, while explaining that since humans believe that it does, the way we believe Santa or the hog father does, we make it so it does. Grimdock is an adjective derived from the tagline for Warhammer 40k, which states that in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war, and in some of the novels, at least a few of the Cyphus Kane stories. For instance, it states straightforwardly, in the grim dark future, whether this came after Grimdock began to be popularly used as an adjective is not wholly clear. Probably after. It is generally used to describe a dilapidated, dystopian crapsack world setting which it would really suck to live in, as say Somalia, North Korea, the north of England and the setting of Warhammer 40k itself. In fairness to the franchise and its defenders, this is because the published material primarily focuses on war and cults and other horrible things. There are supposed to be many pleasant and peaceful worlds and sectors in the Imperium. But they are mostly ignored as they are boring, and when they do appear in lore or fluff, they are usually to go from zero problems to totally fucked, very quickly. It can also be used to describe artwork that has a grim dark feel, even if the setting itself would not normally be considered grim or dark, or something sinister or uncommonly threatening intimidating in real life. This often applies to fan art and retrofagatory as well. Depending on your own personal tolerances for grim darkness of course, it can be taken to the extreme. Just like with all descriptive trays. There is a point in which it becomes more ridiculous than anything else, because everything is indefeasibly tragic all the time. The term for this being grim derp which is explained further below. This is an accusation often leveled at Warhammer itself, and led some to rail against Grim Dark as a whole, decrying the concept as ridiculous attempts at edginess, typically by teenagers, and using the expression to refer solely to such over-the-top settings in a strictly pejorative manner. Others actually embrace this ridiculousness and run with it, including Warhammer 40k itself due to being a much more obviously comedic setting in early editions, insisting that the detractors or even the creators who take it seriously are making a mistake. Some people embrace the grim darkness and mix it up with some humor, like painting necrons with bright colors to make them look like edible candy figurines, especially if they are orc players. But the schism between taking Warhammer's grim darkness seriously or not is mostly visible with races such as the TAU who are noticeably less grimdark visually than most of the other races and are either loved or absolutely hated for it, when not hated for being overpowered as shit. Meanwhile, another sizable percentage postulate that grimdarkness lends greater moral and ethical complexity to asserting, based on the fallacy that darkness always equals depth. Such people usually cite the works of Dan Abnett and many other Warhammer 40k writers to lend credence to such suppositions. These people are clearly ignoring that fact that most writers tone the grim duck way down. What? You didn't think the fact that the Imperium being an effective government, civilians having normal happy lives on par with the Scandinavians, commissars who never balam their troops was odd needless to say. Grimdark is a rather polarizing subject whose discussion often leaves little room for a middle ground. Speaking of, the polar opposite of Grimdark is Noblebright, a deliberate inversion of grim and dark nature where honor, chivalry, happiness and high adventure rule the day, as opposed to dying in a ditch from a supernatural plague as you run out of potable water and can no longer wait for the logistics department to process your dead comrades into something slightly more palatable before you start eating them. Oh, and being balamed by a commissar for even starting to look a little sad from these thoughts. Although, it could be argued that 40k proper is actually nobler dark. Although the law claims one man cannot make a difference and heroes are meaningless. Grim, we see the complete opposite of that actually happening in the law. 40k fluff. 40k, not just 30k, is crammed to bursting with heroes who made major differences. If anything, 
40k seems to be about the difference one man can make rather than showing one man cannot make a difference. Even the events revolve around the great man idea of basically superheroes and supervillains moving the galaxy. And it's not just actual superhumans doing this. It is nonetheless a very dark setting, though. Common grimdark themes. Massive. Imperialist. Overbearing. Bureaucratic dystopian dictatorships, for example, Nazi Germany clones, Soviet Union China clones, or straight out examples of Big Brother is watching you. Constant, never ever ending warfare, usually as a horrific combination of outdated tactics and technology, and sometimes overly advanced technology, for example, Sending line infantry armed with single shot last guns against a heavy bolt and nest. Horrifyingly large death tolls are perfectly normal. Genocide is also perfectly normal, and in many cases encouraged and espoused. Slavery is also perfectly normal, and sometimes considered a great necessity. Massive constructs are often built via slave labor. Everyone is racist towards non-humans, elves, mutants, fungus, lizards, worms, robots, aliens, each other. Vice versa for literally every race. Speaking of xenophobia towards every species, those who express sympathy for a hated race and or intermingle with said race, are usually publicly humiliated, tortured, and usually purged. Daily dose of HFY and awesome. The vast majority are poor people who literally live in shit, pollution, crime, and a plethora of all kinds of filthy diseases. Except for a few greedy upper 1% who own 99.9% .9 of everything. You, a poor bastard, are being farmed for shits and giggles by said few greedy upper 1%. Most of the poor bastards are being forced to work 23 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year, in factories and or forced labor camps, until their bodies give out forever. They're probably making weapons and equipment for the military, which is where the rest of the poor bastards are. Duck, disgraceful and recondite past covered with lies propaganda. Deception and partiality. The higher powers do indeed give you consideration. They're just malevolent as all fuck. Chronic backstabbing. Just like in real life relationships. Who hurt you. Friendly fire child soldiers. Just like in real life. Your morning alarm clock is the stray bullets you hope don't hit you. From the gangsters doing a drive-by on their enemy who happens to be in the same district to whom you don't even belong to or like. Status quo is God. Literally. Change is worse. Cybernetics and cyborgs. The less human, the better. Daily forecasts are a ghoulie call for a 80% chance or more of Balam. Police brutality. Even minor crimes can have major punishments. Being innocent or even a victim of crime can be counted as a crime. All participants in a crime, whether perpetrator or victim, are charged. Government agencies that are always there to fuck you over at the slightest hint of heresy. Did I mention that the Inquisition commits planetary genocide 24 stroke 7? The coxsuckers responsible for most of the shittiness are not only getting away with it, but are surviving and thriving without becoming major targets for the Noblebride forces. Torture that makes the sire look like saints. Sanity checks. Criminally insane delusional psychotics tortured in filthy mental asylums. In case of no failed sand checks. Disgusting. Horrifying. Tentacled eldritch abominations that are often the cause of aforementioned criminal insanity. Rape. Just like in real life. And often by said tentacled eldritch abominations. Surgery without anesthesia. Cannibalism. In three forms. For power. Embracing the myth of you are what you eat. For food value. Sometimes this is concealed by callous authorities as some other kind of food. Sometimes. It's just a biological, cultural or desperation thing. For the sheer fun of it. Want chemotherapy or some other expensive treatment? Well, you have to eviscerate that old dropout student of yours in order to pay. In fact even surgery without anesthesia is a luxury available only to wealthy or important ones. As are all other forms of medicine. 99% of people are expected to die when they fall sick or get injured. That is when they don't get executed for falling sick or getting injured. Human experiments. Sometimes willingly, but most of the time not zombie plagues. Ritual occult sacrifices. Massive amounts of blood, gore, guts, pain and hatred. No personal opinion or choice. Only the illusion of it. 
in which you probably end up an unwilling slave, or something worse, anti-intellectualism, and it's justified because even an instant of unprotected thinking risks mass destruction, PTSD, nihilism, racism is actually right, gothic and emo aesthetics, with the help of tons of decorative skulls, there are no good guys, everyone's a jerk, including yourself, especially yourself, everyone is evil either because they're just plain monsters or because they are trying to survive which makes everyone evil to everyone else, the guys everyone refer to be good or nice are actually just the least evil bunch. And would still make your average high fantasy sea arch villains look like saints in comparison. The real good guys are either the ones, usually, mostly hated, and are going to get fucked over beyond human recognition usually without any logical reason or too few to make any difference. Aforementioned good guys are only good because they do care about their allies and civilians and generally try to make the place less shitty for those they care for. But they still wouldn't hesitate a second before doing pretty horrible things like terrorist actions against the man, killing a defenseless Xeno child, etc. The aforementioned defenseless Xeno child needed to be killed either because it was guaranteed to grow up to be a monster, would grow to compete for resources needed for survival, would be corrupted, was already a monster, or any number of reasonable justifications that would leave a modern man in frustrated tears trying to justify not killing it. Welcome to Warhammer 40,000. Magic is inherently malevolent and actively seeks to corrupt and destroy those unfortunates gifted with magical abilities and everything around them at the time. You either die a worthy death or you live long enough to see yourself becoming something that you've always hated. Everyone will most likely die in the end, especially the ones important to and including the main character. Always polluted, never sunny. No ice cream, no lollipops either. Death or suicide will only make things much, much worse in Lovecraftian levels, as a hive of disgusting, incomprehensibly evil supernatural demons are waiting patiently to eternally torment your own life and roast your soul alive day and night forever and ever, again and again and again and again. Tremendous potential for offensive dark comedy lulls. And if you ever, ever try to change this shitty world or try to help one person just a little, you will probably suffer terrible consequences, because altruism is a dying philosophy, and because your reasoning is flawed, Life sucks. There's only war. You're probably going to get eaten by tyrannids. No gf good luck and have fun. Even using the wrong calendar is heresy. Stuff considered grimdark Warhammer 40,000. Naturally. Coined the term. Warhammer fantasy battle. But less than you think. It's a lot closer to Nobler Dark until the world was actually destroyed. Now. Age of Sigma continues it and is. Slightly. Better in so much that it is unlikely to be destroyed, though that may imply an even worse eternal stalemate. The world wars, especially the western front of WW1, the Armenian Greek Assyrian genocides, the eastern front of World War II, and everything involving World War II Japanese Army Navy and PAL civvies. The countless wars of the 1990s in Africa, including but not limited to the Rwandan genocide, Liberian child soldiers, Sierra Leonean amputations, slave labor in the Congo, etc. Post-colonial Africa in general until the 21st century and even then there are various minor problems like ISIS and other religious extremists, rebel attacks, constant coups and piracy, the Belgian Congo, the medieval dark ages that Warhammer 40,000 was originally based on, post-apocalyptic stuff tends to default to grimdark, dwarf fortress dark sun end of war blood, the main character is a undead wild west gunslinger who has to bring down a dark god's cult Shakespeare's tragedies, especially Macbeth and Hamlet, 1984 soil and green, paranoia, they used for parodying 1984, the majority of the tragedy genre of stories. Rifts, the Half-Life universe after the Resonance Cascade. Portal once you get past the memes. The Helgas from the Killzone universe. The Kerberos trilogy. But special mentions to Jim Roh, The Wolf Brigade. A series of films that basically gave birth to Killzone single-handedly. Seriously. Look at the comparisons between the Helgast and the film's protect gear, 
It is blatant, set in an alternate history where Japan was occupied by Germany rather than America at the end of World War II. In Jinro, the nation is constantly in social turmoil with left-wing communist terrorist guerrillas using children as bomb couriers against two police force of Japan. The normal-looking police force, backed by the Japanese KGB sire hybrid and the original Helgast called the Kerberos Panzer Cops. Jin Ro is a political thriller film that largely talks about the problems of the good guy, bad guy dichotomy and how juvenile it is for stories to portray these things in real life. All of the films have a downer ending. So if you are looking for a happy ending, you're gonna get disappointed. Despite what some people may argue, the Kerberos trilogy is a condemnation of all extremist ideas and actions. It's a Mamoru Oshii film of Ghost in the Shell fame. What do you fucking expect? Everything in Gears of War. The fact that the primary weapon in the series features a chainsaw bayonet designed to utterly rip out the innards of anyone unfortunate to be at the receiving end is already by itself grimdark. Everything in the Resistance universe. The Machina Games Wolfenstein games. The Nazis crushed the Allies in 1947 with insane technology and one world war II. The setting pulls no punches in depicting how nightmarish the world would become if the Nazis were free to enact their racist and reactionary ideology to its fullest. Manhattan was nuked off the earth. London is now a slum filled with humiliating monuments to the Nazi victory, and a giant robot that literally crushes any uprisings. Indigenous peoples in Africa and South America are being exterminated wholesale. There are concentration camps on the moon, Hitler has been deified, and untermensch live in hiding and constant fear for their lives. Blame. Devilman. Especially Kribbaby. Berserk Goblin Slayer. Pretty much berserk if it was set in a Dungeons and Dragons world. Emergence. 177,013. Kingdom Death. Makes 40k's setting seem pleasant and cheerful. EastEnders. Especially at Christmas. Grimdark songwriting don't rest your head sly industries. Imagine if the Emperor was not only still walking around, but was a callous boosnessman with a permanent skeleton face and nobling armor. Imagine a civilization that exists almost entirely to strip mine itself in the name of consumerism. With snuff television being the primary source of entertainment and anyone trying to do boosness not on Slough's payroll being branded a soft company to be exterminated. Oh. And truly horrid aliens that were thought extinct centuries ago are now making a comeback and occult fuckery of varying flavors is manifesting in increasing amounts in Mort City, Slaz Capital, the Matrix World of Darkness, with special mention going to Wraith, The Oblivion, a game so bleak it's rumored to have actually caused fits of chronic depression in players, Kthulhutech Call of Kthulhu, depending on how you do it, everything from HP, Lovecraft and the Kthulhu mythos, Though this can vary when you add in other mythos writers like August Derleth. Playing mortals in Exalted Neon Genesis Evangelion. Especially End. Muv Love often compared to 40k in how bleak and brutal the series is. Midnight setting for D&D. Fatal. I have no mouth and I must scream. Just the title itself should give you a clue on how horrific the game is. The video game is terrifying. Especially with its endings. And the short story it is based on is even more horrifying. Humanity has been wiped out except for five people, who trapped inside a complex controlled by a misanthropic, reality warping supercomputer keeping them alive to torture them and alter their minds and or bodies in cruelly ironic ways. The Witcher. Racism. Genocides. Dozens of monsters that want to eat your face whenever you enter a random forest or cave or ruins. The video game adaptation even features a medieval Hitler running the Witch Hunters, a fanatical order of racist scumbags dedicated to wiping out both mages and non-humans in the name of the Eternal Fire. Meanwhile, the neighboring empire starts a series of wars against northern kingdoms, where the series takes place in which both sides descend into scorched earth warfare, all the while backstabbing their allies and generally being a colossal wall of dicks to the point that close to 70% of civilian population in war zones died from raiding, famine and occasional outbreaks of extra dimensional plagues. To add insult to injury, the whole world is doomed due to the, slowly, encroaching ice age, 
and the only person that could save it took two glances at this shit show and decided to fuck off to a parallel universe and let them all die, because it would be a mercy to be fair, though, she comes back, if only to save her adoptive mother and father from said ice age, as she still maintains a fuck the rest of humanity attitude. Dark souls, the entire world is dying, specifically, most of the population is undead, you die constantly and you have to fight enemies larger and filthier than you are, including a naked bitch with a spider vagina. Also, fake tits. Stuck in an infinite loop where a hero constantly saves the world, and everything goes back to normal before hitting another grimdark cycle every thousand years. Compare with Nobladark and check your mileage. Drakengard and its related franchise. Near. Basically, the god in this setting is a massive dick so he infects humans with zombie aids out of boredom and watch them kill each other for the lulz. Cam, the player, the former prince of a fallen kingdom, due to his parents being killed by a black dragon, had to fight the zombie army. He unironically enjoys slaughtering any living things after waging a bunch of other conflicts and lost his ability to speak after he made a pact with a dragon in exchange for companionship and power. In Drakengard, making such a pact with another creature makes you lose a certain part of you. He had to team up with a blind pedophile priest, a baby-eating elf witch, and a rageless Shota. His sister unknowingly to him is a crazy incest bitch. Driven mad by the pain she endures because she was forced to become a goddess of the seal. Some kind of administrator chosen by the god to maintain space and time. The job sucks. She had to be separated from her family and she's unable to kill herself because her caretaker would prevent that from happening. And to top it off her parents die tragically. And then you have the villains. Mana, an abused 8 year old child descended from one of the evil cloned sister's brother from the prequel, was controlled by the eldritch forces of the Watchers, Weed, the dickhead god himself, who are in charge of the zombie armies with humanity's extinction being their goal. Due to the influence of the Watchers group on the Empire Kingdom of its setting, the world is engulfed in flames and corpses. The true ending for the game is that everyone except Cam dies and he somehow end up moving a magical doomsday device created by the god of the world. Tokyo Japan of our world to be exact detonate it and doom the human race. It is said that Drakengard as a series has a fuck ton of timelines and a timeline was born from each of the endings with each ending being bad, or if not worse than the previous. Surprisingly the ending mentioned above is consider canon and it is where the sequel near took place, after 1462 years no less with more grimdark ensuing. Drakengard 2 was pretty bright light since it was directed by a different director but is still part of branch timeline while Drakengard 3 is the prequel retelling how the god tries to destroy the world by sticking an evil parasite flower on some psychopathic girl. Each time the girl died it creates an evil clones of her that will try to rule the world with their evil song magic. Obvious. It's also Grimdark since it led to the tragic Grimdark rape source that is the plot of the first game. In Nier, the world sets 1462 years into the future. After our hero and his dragon fucked up the world by killing and detonating the doomsday device, it released some kind of magical evil virus that min raped and turned people into salt if they don't submit. After countless grimdark conflicts involving child soldiers, human experiments and more resource shortage, the scientists decided to separate the rest of the survivor souls, gushed out from their bodies, hoping they could outlast the pandemic. But of course all these attempts are futile failure because near. Our hero ended up killing the only thing that could save humankind, dooming them all to extinction. Finally we have Nier, Automata, 8480 years later, where new androids were created by the last human survivors. One of the Nier's companions Emil, a bizarre magical weapon created from some crazy experiment. He is over 8480 years old or so at this point had to clone himself over 9,000 times just to fight the aliens, which not only made him lose his mind and memories but also his sanity. Oh and the humans that escaped to the moons turn out to be long dead. When the rest of androids find out, 
they proceed to kill themselves in a batchet frenzy. To make this sound even more painful and tragic, the androids have the human concepts of pain and emotions programmed to them, making their death even more painful to be felt. Mass Effect, while its universe overall is hardly grimdark overall, the Reapers and what happens to harvested individuals is some of the sickest forms of grimdark possible. During the Reaper War, trillions of people across the galaxy were vaporized, crushed, dissolved slowly and or violently converted into cyber zombies or brainwashed slaves. And that's just the latest Reaper War. The Reapers have committed so much galactic genocide beforehand. They turned it into a regularly scheduled event and made the galaxy their farm laboratory. There are many other forms of grimdark in the relatively nobbler dark nobbler bright universe of Mass Effect, one of the most notable being the Genophage, a bioweapon deployed against the Krogan races to hold the Krogan rebellions. This bioweapon was basically a massive, permanent genetical fetus deletus that dramatically lowered Krogan birth rates and caused a lot of stillborns. Literal piles of children that never lived actual in game quote. If that wasn't bad enough, they live on a death world and have a warlike culture, so this puts them at risk of extinction. And if that wasn't bad enough, they've been suffering under the genophage for over a thousand years after the Krogan rebellions ended. With prior attempts to cure it never attempted, unsuccessful or sabotaged. Killzone. Again, the second extracellular war alone deserves its own page of grimdark. Humanity and their alien descendants, the Helgast, engage in an irracial war of genocide, more genocide, and even more genocide. Technology has devolved in many areas, and battles turn into endless slaughters as hundreds of thousands of men and women are thrown into a verdant Stalingrad hybrid scenario. What's even more horrible is how literally everyone is evil. Not just the Helgast, literally all of humanity is warped. The Earth-based UCN corrupt and bureaucratic. They want to strangle all their colonies with an iron fist and they intentionally keep the colonial military, the ISA. Weaker than it otherwise could be so the centralized military could easily crush them if they rebelled. UCN cruisers for example are basically dreadnoughts in comparison to those of the ISA, which has caused more than a few problems for the ISA when fighting the Helgast. The Vectans hypocritically imperialistic, believing the Helgast deserved to perish for their militarism and, failed, invasion of their planet. The Helgast racist, imperialistic genocidal maniacs believing themselves to be superior and even some thinking they need to kill every human in the universe. For Helgast purity, the Helgast are a literal representation of a society and people warped by grimdarkery. The planet of Helgen is inhospitable, forcing almost all its inhabitants to wear gas masks. Society is highly fascist, militaristic, and any form of dissent is met with re-education, a bullet to the head. While the government itself is highly nepotistic, where opportunistic scumbags manipulate Helgas nationalism for their self-benefit. Also, technology and living standards in the civilian sector is extremely poor, as the majority of the advanced technology went over to the military. The fanbase of the series is certainly odd though due to the fact that this concept that everyone is evil has went completely over their heads and due to the blatantly unfair treatment of the Helgasts. Kind that makes the Treaty of Asai seem all fair and good by comparison. In the lead up and aftermath of the first extracellular war, they have a tendency to see the Helgast, despite being the antagonists as the good guys. Their totalitarian society and the fact that the Helgast commit more or less every war crime known to man apparently didn't make it obvious that this is not so. Dead Space. A group of human discovered a device of unknown origin called markers and it turned them into undead alien monster. Worse is that the device is sentient and it could instruct intelligent human into replicate them, even brainwashing them into starting a cult. In sequel, it was revealed markers were created by a long extinct alien species. It is obvious the said species was turned into monster by their own creation. And the markers continue to infect other intelligent species. To the point the corpses of their entire civilizations formed into a giant undead moon capable of telepathically mindfuck people. So far there are 11 of these damn moons. 
Meaning there are so many goddamn planet worth of alien life forms that were killed and formed those living moon ball of corpses that a large portion of star system were left lifeless, forming dead space. Roll credit. These moons are also clever assholes that they make their own meals by sending markers to other life forms just so they could evolve faster. Built up a civilization. Turned them into undeads then turned into giant undead moon. A hopeless cliffhanger was shown at the end of the last game on Earth's orbit, where all the undead moon gather and preparing their usual routine of creating more undead moon from corpses. Only the protagonist, his partner and the protagonist's girlfriend were aware of this, which making it all the more dreadful for them since they were the only survivors, and even they had no reliable ways against the undead moon's powerful psychic mind rape, as it drive the rest of the humanity's mind to kingdom come. Gears of war. Again. Decades of civil war. Genocide and weapons of mass destruction has turned your home planet into a quasi-dead world. The human race is close to extinction. Women are reduced to birthing machines. Your government is an uncaring fascist scumbag. The weather is often rain consisting of razor sharp ice crystals that could cut you into ribbons. You are fighting a never ending war with genocidal monsters from the underground and the world is literally dying from super fuel. To make matters even worse, even before the locust war, humanity was locked in a near 80 year war between two rivaling superpowers over the aforementioned super fuel. The COG and the UIR. Both governments are ruthless imperialistic, fascistic, communistic bastards of a government whose war crimes will make the likes of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany look like amateurs. When even the locust have a point by calling us out for being exactly the same genocidal monsters as they are. You know Gears of War is fucked. Oh and the planet is called Sarah, or as when said backwards. The Resistance series, again. Humanity is losing a brutal war of genocidal attrition against a parasitic alien species, the Chimera. Russia, Asia, and nearly all of Europe has been converted into a desolate wasteland, suitable for the Chimera species. Whatever is left of humanity has been driven into cave dwellings. Humans captured by the Chimera are converted into a Chimera hybrid. Basically the Chimera equivalent of our co-flagellants. Helgert London. Most of David Bowie's songs about 1990. World Devastators and Star Wars. Seriously. If you read about them without knowing that they are from Star Wars, you could easily mistake them for something from 40k. And we're not talking about Star Wars Legacy and the genocide of Amon Calamari. The first two Hellraiser movies Event Horizon Gantz Cyberpunk 2020. Shadoran. While not the worst in the grimdark department, Shadoran definitely has its moments. The Rinraku Arcology shut down being a prime example. For instance the oppressive mega corporations reducing people to an identification number. With people not having one. Four reasons. Don't exist legally. Helsing. Just all of Helsing. Though it can easily slide into Grindurp. A little girl seeing her mother killed while hiding in a closet. Yeah that's intense. In a moment of desperation. Shove a rod into the guy's eyeball. Only for him to not be mortally wounded that's pretty unfortunate. Said guy deciding to fuck the corpse as his smashed eyeball hangs from the socket that's just silly. Drifters. By the same author. The protagonists are a bunch of kill happy murder hobos drawn from various psychos from all throughout history into a generic fantasy world who have decided to save the world by conquering it. One country at a time. One of the major powers of the setting turns out to have been founded by Adolf friggin Hitler. Even Joan of Arc, who Irol was noted for being a pacifist, is warped into a bloodthirsty psycho. The Beg, who wants to kill all humans, and is noted to be a step up from his subordinates, who want to kill everything, is all but outright states to be geezers. Bioshock and Bioshock 2, as well as Bioshock Infinite. Though it comes hidden behind a smiling facade of barbershop singing in the 4th of July. Anything from the Zeely sequence. The interim coalition of governments for example, is such a grim ridden shithole that they make the Imperium of Man look like pussies filled with sunshine and rainbows in comparison and make the Adeptus Custodes shit themselves in collateral fare. Despite achieving time travel, conquering the entire universe through genocide that would make the Necrons look like children and shooting neutron stars at 0.99c at the speed of light, 
The ICOG is still a minor nuisance compared to the Zeli and their enemies. The Fatino birds. Stephen Baxter was able to construct the insignificance and petty malevolence of man in a few books better than G Dub's more questionable authors did in decades. TL. DR the arm wishes they would be as cool as the ICOG. A small example is a soldier. Pyrrhus invents an incredible way of outmaneuvering the enemy and does a huge impact on the war. He captures a Zeli ship, turning back time and going to the past. He is sent to a penal unit guaranteeing death literally for thinking outside the box all of stephen baxter's works arguably qualify evolution can be summed up as humanity almost overcame its flaws fixed the damage it did to earth and ushered in a nobler bright future and it might have worked but just then a super volcano erupted wiped out human civilization and everyone died the end there's even a chapter in the middle of the book outright stating it also that humans are nothing but vicious bastards who rape kill and destroy everything they touch and have been ever since our ancestors were rats under the feet of dinosaurs but other animals aren't much better north korea which is essentially real life oceania a totalitarian nightmare almost completely isolated from the rest of the world with a leader whose name you are literally forbidden from saying without the prefix supreme leader. Universal conscription is in place for men with service lengths of over 10 years from age 17 to 30. For comparison, in South Korea, where compulsory military service length is also among the highest in the world, the service length is 21 to 24 months depending on the chosen branch. The country has has no access to the internet and only has its own intranet with government controlled websites. Long gone are the days when the government had any interest in making the country good. Now all they care about is simply staying in power. No matter how much poverty and how many famines the rest of the country has to suffer for it. And if you get on the government's really bad side. You and at least two other generations of your family get sent to prison camps to be executed or become the playthings of the prison guards until you die. The Goon Comics series by Eric Powell. Because circus hillbillies, werewolves with midget hand phobias, and the zombie priest are the least of it all. Children of men. A future where humans are no longer fertile and going extinct. And then someone finds a pregnant woman and nearly everyone in the world fights over her. A song of ice and fire a game of thrones. Good guys screw up monumentally or never win. The only people who get ahead are amorally manipulative assholes and everyone is going to be massacred and enslaved by the evil ice elf necromancers in the end. And if they somehow survive. Then another war for the Iron Throne will happen after the winner gets their revenge bonus satisfied and later their kids would need to clean up the Wankstins. Dishonored, Grimdark, and Steampunk. Only in the kill fucking everyone ending though. Dark Seed, Grimdark to the core the first game is about the main character being fucked in the head. HR Geiger's artwork helps too. XCOM, the remake and the original. As a parody of the G.I. Joe Badder stereotype, you're struggling with funding and even your gods in human form, some of whom make certain chapters of a start sweep can get fucked over by sectoids. Pula Magi Madoka Magica Being Maguka's suffering. Adventure Times Backstory. Path of Exile. The game's setting is basically a documentary on the corruption of Roman Empire. Basically there is this continent called the Reeklist. The land is pretty much cursed with undeath and mutation due to Thaumaturgiaca magic in the form of gems that grants ability, which came from the beast. Some kind of eldritch abomination living in the mountain and the source of all this evil magic shit. Many great empire rose and fell on the continent with their own fucked up and downfall. The first empire, the Val were some kind of Aztec, Mayan inspired empire who loves to sacrifice people for power. So much that they were responsible for corrupting the beast, which partly responsible for what Reclus is today. After that. A new empire called the Eternal Empire was built on top the former and began outlawing thaumaturgy and gems for the next 1000 years, until a tyrant was thrown after he cheated death maze trial and was killed in a rebellion staged by Vol, who is obsessed with the old purity ideal and decided to trust Malache, a previous evil asshole thaumaturgist employed by the previous emperor to destroy the beast, the source of all magic, in detail. Vol was convinced by Malache into thinking that only those who study thaumaturgy could destroy thaumaturgy. Obviously, 
Malache ended up betraying Vol as well as everyone in the Empire, as well as the Godom world by merge with the Beast and unleash a series of cataclysm that made what Reclist is today, and the bastard achieve a twisted sense of immortality where he is now but a evil monster living inside the Beast who is obsessed with creating nightmarish monsters. Despite the Vol's fucked up, part of the Empire survived in the form of an island nation south called Oriath. It was ruled under a theocratic government, following the laws of purity with an iron fist where they reject impurity so much that anyone who rejects their doctrines is met with either slavery, death or exiled to Reeklist, which the player came to be. They are also racist, dressed in stylish uniform fashioned with eagle, gold and the typical red armband, all the more reinforce their real life counterpart. Since they inherit the previous empire's slavery culture, they enslave a group of archipelago tribal minority known as the Karu, serving as the Rome equivalent of barbarian tribe slave race for Oriath and Oboi. Oh How Oriath loves to oppress the shit out of them using them for free labor, torture them, experiment them and putting them in the grand arena as gladiators entertainment. They also worship this golden figure with red eyed called Innocence, who is the major god of Oriath, the Templar's most beloved golden subject of worship and they believe themselves to be the most pure and innocent while calling others like the Karu and the heretics to be impure and sinned. As if things are not bad enough, later game where after the player killed the beast, it awoke the gods from the slumber. Gods who were once mortal but sold their humanity for power in order to ascend. As a result, the gods are no better than the humans. Most of them were downright psychopath. There's a god called Yugal who was once a scholar obsessed with fear that he study about it so much he eventually ascended to godhood became some kind of four leg walking mouth thing. Mentally depressed, there's this insect goddess called Rislatha who is afraid of losing her children that she makes everyone hers by having her parasite control everything that moves, or just her downright bloody warlords. The Kara Wargat, who is the one to encourage his tribesman to stop being peaceful and tell them to go kill shit and babies which are actually Rislothas and is therefore responsible for her ugly transformation. Although some gods were good, they ended up being corrupted by their followers for fuck how longs while the beast forcing them to slumbering away. After their returning, some human made contact with them through their mind radio advertisement, and were made to become their followers, where they were granted mutations, or blessing, some would say and went on their own ape shit rampage across the world to claim their own territories or invade others. Most of the Karu slaves in Oriath ended up getting the worst mutation of all since they worship this kit of a god, an evil Karu god who was repeatedly punished for his gluttony, yet despite its mouth being mutilated in such way for him to stop consuming anything, he still doesn't even manage to reach godhood. In order to free from their slavery and shitty treatment from their Templar tormentor, all the more powered up Kitova with their desires for vengeance and blood. The slave's faith for Kitova is so overwhelming that not one on Oriath is safe from Kitova's power. Even the Templar, after their god innocence that had been recently decimated by the player are now vulnerable to Kitova influences, that they switched side without a second thought easily giving up their old faith like the arsehole heretic they had always been. The only god who managed to retain its sanity from all this madness is called Sin, Innocence's brother who is this creepy black winged figure that could make everyone thought of angels of death whenever he pops up. Despite this, he is smart enough to realize the danger of godhood and create the beast in order to force them asleep. This includes his wife and daughter, whom were also deities like him and were also corrupted that they had to be put down by the player because even Sin finds it painful to kill his own kin and lover. Even after the player has killed all the gods, Reeklist remains the same. Thaumaturgy and gems still exist, but at least Oriath is no longer ruled by an extreme religious organization. Right Space Station 13, Space Paranoia Simulator. Some might not consider this game grimdark. But the lore is set in a dystopian future where capitalism and unforgiving bureaucracy rules the universe. Your life is expandable, and the media is controlled. Your only choice is working until you die, or getting killed by either rival corporate operatives, space wizards, cultists, death squads or spies posing as your co-workers. Barrow Trauma, 
inspired by Space Station 13, centered on a submarine crew in the underground oceans of Europa. Crew members are expendable. You're always outgunned. The submarine is almost constantly under attack by massive sea creatures and most missions are much more likely to end in disaster than success. Also, you explode as soon as you step outside the sub. Pokemon Tabletop Adventures Optionally, original Grimm's Fairy Tales Hansel and Gretel, for example. Alien, as in the biomechanical, parasitic, acid-blooded brainchild of Ridley Scott and the late H.R. Geiger. Halo, the setting of Halo is one grand scale of a cosmic horror story centered around absolute hopelessness and bleakness of a universe governed by hyper-malevolent gods. Our good guys, the unskids are semi-authoritarian big brother is watching you. Fascistic style government that have no qualms dumping nukes on a civilian population if rebellion is cited. The unsk also have no problems dicking over their only alien friends to benefit humanity while also being bogged down in a political quagmire. The Covenant are much, much worse, while anything from the Forerunner trilogy is just a high concoction of nightmare fuel inside a depressing milkshake. Now with newly added fluff in the tabletop games and other books, Halo is going eerily straight down the WH-40K route. Covenant now having different chapters and sects, slip space shifting more like space hell, the unskewed sending secret police to silence and torture innocents and an ancient eldritch AI of malevolent aura that shares the same name to a certain armless failure. Seriously we ain't making this shit up battle tech about half the time. On a good day, mercenaries fight proxy wars and follow the Geneva Convention to keep damage and body counts low. Comster keeps everyone in line. And bomb back to the Stone Age actually means your spaceships blow up and you enjoy a comfortable 1990s era lifestyle, on bad days, the Crusader clan storm in and break everything. The word of Blake Jihad starts nuking everyone they don't like, and all FTL communication breaks plunging the galaxy into a new dark age, erasing centuries of political and technological progress. Factorio, subtle, but, lone human, aliens want to kill you, everything you do makes smog, and your goal is to cover the world in industry. Concrete, machines, and gun turrets. The world isn't dead when you arrive, but you're damn well going to kill it yourself or die trying. Kane and Lynch. Sweet Emperor. Kane and Lynch. Forget your gtas and paydays. In it, you control two murderous middle-aged fugitives, one of which is explicitly mentally troubled and not in a funny way. The kind of true underworld scum that can only be described as genuinely repulsive. That plus the fact that nothing ever goes right for anyone and the story just adds to it. The sequel is outright grimderp. See Bellow. Attack on Titan. You cannot win. Ever. And if you do, you've probably lost all your friends who've been eaten by giant freaky mutants who don't even need food. Yee. To put things bluntly, it turns out even the titans are perpetually suffering. The whole setting runs on a system of human sacrifice and cannibalism that would make the Aztecs proud. This is a series where facing the apocalypse does not bring out the best in humanity but instead remains as fractious, self-destructive, and divisive as ever, which is honestly one of the points of the story, and the leaders of humanity make the higher lords of terror look competent. Things are such a clusterfuck with no hope of change that one of the characters has decided the only way things can get better is to wipe out every human that isn't a member of their ethnic group. And what's worse the plot seem to be proving them right. Metro series, both the books and games, but mostly in the books where the last known humans are hiding in underground subway tunnels, and when not trying to finish each other off are fighting endless hordes of mutants and other, much worse things. Also, if you're one of the stalkers, the few brave ones that head to the surface to loot anything they can find, you risk being eaten by flying demons. Hell, it even has the same abandon all hope vibe in the intro, just like 40k. And that is just the tip of the iceberg, Note as the books go on the grim darkness does tone down by showing the areas outside of the city to be in much better living conditions and other metros, though not all the books are written by the same author. Madness combat, no regret, no remorse, no reason, 
Only Madness, Lisa the RPG, The Darkness video games, Fairly Average a Futterly Spoiled Gangster is almost killed and inherits an ancient lineage of shadow monsters that feed off of shadows. Said gangster then decides to go on a revenge killing spree against his uncle who ordered the whole thing while also fighting off the will of the monsters and protecting his girlfriend. The first two Hyperion books, Elfin Light. Where the next step of the evolution of mankind is a group of schizophrenic homicidal mutant girls with invisible tentacle hands and a hair trigger temper who will either kill you in the worst way possible or infect you with their gene to increase their numbers. Most of Stephen King's works, as the joke goes. Some people say that Stephen King's works are so fucked up they should come with a content warning. The reply is that they do have a content warning. They have the words written by Stephen King on the front. S-T-A-L-K-E-R. You travel a desolate landscape filled with mutants and all the horrific varieties. Failed science projects. Courtesy of the secret cabal of scientists settled there after us arrest dissolution. Anomalies that you often can't see and kill you instantly and a lot of renegades bandits fanatics zombies. Your gear breaks all the time. Resources are scarce and your goal is to get to the highly dangerous Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which is also protected by lots of fanatics with the best gear available. If you make it through that hellish place that is the zone, you'll likely get one of the five really grim dark endings. And if you paid a lot of attention to certain seemingly useless items along the way, you may get one of the other two grimdark endings. The rest of the world largely ignores what's happening inside the zone. Aside from a few scientists that study the deadly phenomena and the international military that maintains a cordon around the zone so the nasty stuff doesn't get out and sometimes send expeditions inside, killing everything and everyone in sight. Also, a new cheeky breaky I've damk the Slenderman mythos. He always watches the FEAR series. Even the third vanilla by comparison game is fucked up. Total War. Attila. Unlike the previous Total War titles, which were about your faction's rise to power from small backwater city tribe country into a mighty empire able to boss around its neighbors into doing your bidding. This one is about the decline of your faction as you desperately try to survive the onslaught of the Huns, whose sole purpose in the game is to worship Tengri by burning, pillaging, and raping their way through the known world. Particularly if you are the Romans. Winning is defined by being the last guy standing who gets to clean up the rubble and dead bodies. Trying to rebuild their world after Attila destroyed it. Seriously. Even the music sounds depressing and foreboding as fuck. Darkest Dungeon. Your ancestor awakened some kind of god that is pretty much Cthulhu's brother and sent you a letter before killing himself. Asking you to mop up the huge mess he created. Enjoy sending parties of four adventurers ranging from baddest lepers to sickle wielding jesters to their deaths in cultist infested ruins. Sewers filled with mutated cannibalistic pigmen. Sea caverns serving as anthropomorphic sea creatures and forests corrupted by evil. And I'm not going to talk about the darkest dungeon itself. Also, have fun dealing with those bandits that are raiding the hamlet for which you spent a fuck ton of resources and upgrades. The day after. And it's worse Brit counterpart. Threads. Lord of War. The worst is that it's based on real events. Now and then. Here and there. The darkest Isaac ever made. Period. Imagine if you will, that you were isocade into a world that took direct inspiration from the Rwandan genocide. Yeah, we are in that type of territory here boys. The setting takes place in an alternate world. 10 billion years into the future where the sun is about to go into a red giant and whatever scraps of humanity are fighting each other for the last remaining sources of water. Expect a lot of child soldiers, child abuse, child torture, child rape and ethnic cleansing to a scarily realistic degree. This is a post-post-apocalyptic world that is designed to break the viewers. It is an anime darker than 40k despite the happy ending due the sheer levels of nihilism and unforgiving horrors of human depravity. As such, it is one of the few isokes that TG could respect. SCP Foundation Universe as a whole is borderline grimdark, as many aspects of the Foundation are mixed between absurd comedy, derp, and pure grimdark. At its very worst, the SCP Foundation has things that make the Demon Killable look nice by comparison. Above all, 
secure, contain, protect, imagine a semi-totalitarian world power funded by world governments to capture and contain anomalous entities, objects and locations so that the rest of mankind can live in a world that makes sense. We're talking animate statues that move when you blink, predating that episode of Doctor Who and a creature that kills anyone that sees its face in any form. One of the most grim dark anomalies is a girl pregnant with something that could cause the end of the world if it is ever born and the only way to stop it from being born is to regularly put her through something unimaginably horrible. The author has said that they never will reveal what exactly it is but it probably involves rape and periodically erase her memories to make sure she doesn't get used to it. And not all of these threats can be contained or stopped and are roaming free to harm innocents. And some of the captured SCPs are not necessarily hostile or evil, but are still imprisoned in a worst case scenario. Oh, and the apocalypse has already happened several times over. Whenever it does humanity is replaced with clones. And they have lost track of how many times they have done this. You can't even escape by dying, as the most of the possible afterlifes are just as bad if not far worse. While the SCP Foundation tries to avoid being outright bad guys, they are willing to do anything to keep the world normal and most of the other factions are morally grey at best and the few good guy factions tend to cause a lot of unintentional harm. But still, secure, contain, protect. Just another day at the office. Shish no Tikoku. The Empire of Corpses. Steampunk. Grimdark. Zombies. Cross references and conspiracies everywhere. It has even become possible to resurrect the dead, giving them their soul and intelligence back. But only two characters profit from it in the end while everyone else stays a slave. The Eternal War, as the name suggests dystopian wars, as the name suggests clock up games where you get to first hand look a sex cult and their destructive side effects. World War Z, the book, after zombies overran most of the world, many people had it so bad that they simply lost the will to live. Fighting in the Paris catacombs with weaker weapons that wouldn't cause a cave and due to hazardous gases everywhere. Russian soldiers rioting over unfair treatment and enforced secrecy ordered under pain of death to kill one in ten of their own squadmates with rocks to teach them the price of freedom and democracy, which they then happily traded away. The survival of the human race hinged on governments following a plan including elements of eugenics and leaving settlements of people behind as zombie bait. People resorted to cannibalism to survive in Canada. North Korea entirely vanished without a trace. Pakistan and Iran nuked each other. After the war officially ended, there are still loose zombies wandering around. Russia has started a breeding program to deal with severe underpopulation. Several species are extinct, and diseases thought to be wiped out are coming back in mass. Space Runaway Ideanry, Zero Yuzumaki, basically a Lovecraftian horror manga where a seaside town gets raped by spirals. Not as weird as it sounds, or maybe it is as weird as it sounds but not as bad. Also has enough body horror to put most chaos spawn to shame. Pretty much anything by Junji Ito, except Junji Ito's cat diary. Yon and Mew. Doom. Demons from hell have overrun Mars and Earth. You are the lone space marine capable of anything. Somewhat of a subversive case of grimdark. It's not you who is afraid of demons. It's the demons who are afraid of you. Commence with the rip and tear. Armored troop of autumns. An old school mech anime. Mankind has been at war for so long that even the computers created to direct strategy don't know what the goal is. War isn't glorious either. Most of the first arc is about a squad that goes rogue and raids their own side's armory to find some loot. While the mech designs aren't pretty or fancy, they are more industrial and utilitarian than many contemporaries, being repurposed exosuits. The main character is a perpetual done right through a mix of natural regeneration abilities, skills and nice supernatural luck, and like, you know, Vulcan, who was just handed something that should have probably belonged to all Primarchs just so that he could make some people jealous. Take notes, gross water. Take notes, the prototype games. New York City is infected with a virus created by a generically unethical corporation called Gentech that mutates people into mutant zombies and or fucking huge deformed beasts. A secret division called Blackwatch is sent to brutally contain the virus. 
Except it turns out they originally created the virus as a way to purge minorities. This may sound like Resident Evil but the resemblance ends here because you play as Alex Mercer. Prototype 1. And James Heller. Prototype 2. Both of them infected by a strain the virus and became superhumans who can shape a shift and gain someone's memories by consuming them. Read violently absorbing them into their bodies. And can grow weapons like claws or a blade arm. So. I just wanna play a game. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedgear.co.uk. One stop shop for coom jar models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and dnd 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeacontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video. Digimon Tamers. Digimon as a franchise is noted to be surprisingly dark and adult for a kid's anime in the mon genre. But Digimon Tamers is exceptionally depressing even by the series standard. Children attempting suicide. Child abuse. Attempted murder on a child. Multiple on-screen deaths of major characters. Torture. Psychological mind rape on a young girl. PTSD on said young girl. Eldritch abominations. Horror and psychological horror. You think Tamers would have a happy ending lol nope. Tamers has a bittersweet ending in which the main kids lose their Digimon partners forever. This is what happens when you allow a guy notorious in psychological horror anime to do a kids show. There is a reason why Tamers is considered the Neon Genesis Evangelion for kids. Digimon Adventure 3. Aimed towards adult fans of the series, takes tamers up a notch in just plain creepiness. Deaths, assisted suicide, infanticide of Digimon babies, psychological damage, grief induced madness, corruption, attempted genocide, racial supremacy, racism, immense property damage with collateral damage and attempted rape from the series former mentor and teacher becoming a creepy sexual predator molesting one of the main characters and choking another one to near death. Both female by the way. Digimon doesn't fuck around. Most good real robot anime video games. Further discussion will result in scub. Full Metal Alchemist. The world is coated by a side of Nobla Bright at the beginning but morphs into 1984 the more you watch read. The world a mistress starts out as fine and dandy. Despite being a fascist military dictatorship, the head of state is literally called Farah. Then it morphs into a world where the main country, a mistress, is at constant war with almost all its neighbors commits genocides left and right and murders anyone who finds out the dark truth. Shin Sekayori also known as From the New World is a novel by Yusuke Nishi, and it has an anime adaptation, which is freaking awesome. Everyone should watch it. Basically it's a dystopian story with people using magic to run their society instead of machines in a world that has deliberately regressed to the medieval level. Every child who doesn't manifest magical abilities by a certain age is killed. And all existing non-magical humans have been genetically engineered into a slave race of mole people so long ago they've forgotten their origins. The magical people are instead engineered to commit unwilling suicide should they use their powers to harm another human. Mole people are fair game, though. And those of them who are too strong and can't manage to control themselves become Lovecraft abominations. Bloodborne or the love child of Dark Souls. Gameplay and Lovecraftian mythology, its main inspiration for setting and theme. Another masterpiece from From Software and Hidetika Miyazaki. TLDR. The game is a mix of Elrich horrors, omnipotent creatures which are fundamentally gods and dark souls, though this time there is no fire to link, only fair. Bet on Soldier Iron Storm, World War 1 got extended by 80 years. 
leading to a world where war is everything, including a televised pastime. Peace is considered a horrifically dissident ideal and there is a shadowy cabal behind the scenes plotting to make the war last forever. Noir in general, from Raymond Chandler's novels to games like This Is The Police, Magical Girl Sight, So Grimdark It Makes Maguka Look Nobler Bright, Wanted, a comic book series which inspired the 2008 action flick. The villains won the war against the heroes and completely erased them from reality. The world of Wanted is one of the most horrific comic book series as it deconstructs the action macho man of the superhero genre and insults the reader, as in Break the Fourth Wall. If they ever felt like rooting for the protagonist. How bad is Wanted crime is not only rampant but is actually part of the law. Enforced by the fraternity, Justice League for bad guys, and the only way to even have the closest thing to a safe and happy life is by murdering your next door neighbor out of paranoia. Furthermore, as the world is cut up into sections and ruled by different super villains, you will most likely be born in a country ruled by either a psychotic bastard who shoots children for shits and giggles, a Lex Luthor archetype who hungers for more unrestrained power. A little Nazi from the future who wants another holocaust. Or a megalomaniac and sociopathic Chinese emperor who makes Mao Zedong like a chump or a completely immortal president for life Mugabe XP that will probably rule for eternity. Our protagonist is a sociopathic, violent, sadistic rapist who assassinates people in ridiculous violent manners that makes the Punisher. Conrad Kurz and Batman look like Constable Kerr in comparison. His first character development was shooting his neighbor in the face because he was too damned nice. Yeah. Our heroes are literally no different than the villains at all. If you could even call them heroes. While characters in WH-40K and Gears of War commit atrocities usually because they have a reason idea or dogma behind their actions. The villains have wanted commit them because they felt like it. Don't even get us started with the super villains who are so repulsive that they are barely redeemable. Wanted is one of those franchises that just makes you feel like a bastard for even trying to root for anyone. In terms of the moral scale, if DC is the classical black and white franchise and Marvel is the classical grey and grey franchise, than what it is the classical black and black franchise. Chaos wishes it could be this efficiently evil. Grim Dawn. In a world called Ken there is magic, monsters, and humans using 19th century tech. A group of mages failed some sort of ritual and accidentally called in a ghost called an ethereal, setting off a chain of events that would lead to the Grim Dawn. They invaded the world by possessing many creatures and humans for their own world domination plan. And the ensuing chaos allowed the Chthontic cult, Mix Corn and Slanishy Pain cults, to come out of the shadows just as the Ethereals started getting shit done. This results in a never ending struggle between humans and multiple otherworldly powers. An optional meeting with a god from the universe tells the player that there are many gods watching this world and none of them, him included, gave a shit about their followers since this is just one of many realities they observe and the tragic event is nothing more than a normal day for him. So players have to fight through undead who are cursed to forever linger in the world, only to get back up as soon as they are defeated. A land corrupted by the ether's green shit that is as harmful as the warp itself, and a crimson forest filled with chthonic cultists. The factions of the good guys aren't much better either. There is either a necrophiliac ice ninja that will enslave the dead or a pretentious templar order whose god is just as bad as the others. The only hope lies in survivors from the ethereal encounters that gain unnatural powers which may potentially corrupt them in the process. Nothing will ever change though since the world now is filled with horrifying creatures and humanity is reduced to pockets of bandits squabbling over the pitiful remnants of their civilization. Invasions are still going strong despite your efforts at the very end of game and other gods are ready to backstab, corrupt, raid and torment every living creature in the world for their own selfish needs. The new expansion Ash of Malmoth adds more grimdark and even a rare instance of sick fuckery in modern video game. The city Malmoth is said to be the first place hit with ethereal's forces so the entire place is nothing but a fucked up zombie town with buildings made out of human flesh. But before the player can get to that fun party however, they would need to cross the jungle, bog place of Ugdenbog. 
A wild swamp and evil infested shithole filled with cannibals and witches that got gangbang from both the ethereals and chthontic force during the grim dawn. You are even allowed to side with the local cannibals in Barrowholm, and much less their evil mind comma to the chthontic and ethereal mind you. Once you got to Malmoth. The true sick fuckery begin. The local ethereals had spare a few human survivors just so they could hunt them down and replenish for their needs of flesh. What's worst is that they have abducted local females, especially younger one, and used them as breeding cattle to produce more test subject and soldiers. Doesn't that sounds like demon killer but it also means that the enemies like ethereal scamp and ethereal imp. Those little shit that are the size of a child you fought are actually... Yeah, I'm done with this shit. Peter Watts. Brutal neuropunk sci-fi horror. As bleak as H.P. Lovecraft but with a list of scientific citations at the end to let you know just how realistic it really is. Hits you with a world ending catastrophe and then manages to make it a thousand times worse. An alien invasion during a hard takeoff singularity. For example, sociopathy and post-human augments abound. Also. The books are free armored warfare, terrorist ultra-nationalist anarchists with tanks, corporations that rule and enslave large portions of the world and the rest of the world might as well be a wasteland. As far as we know, Pandora from the Borderlands games, a whole planet covered in tons of rubbish, industrial equipment, pollution and debris from mining operations by huge intergalactic corporations. A classic example of unregulated capitalism where the few inhabitants, mostly from the abandoned mining operations, fight for survival against hideously mutated and highly dangerous wildlife and go completely mental in the process. What little rational civilization there is is constantly under attack from all sides including by the Hyperion Corporation which wants to purge the planet of all life and start again from scratch. To do this the Beg has built an army of robots and seeks to awaken an ancient, all-powerful, immortal, alien warrior. Which, as it turns out, is very easy to kill. Pandora is essentially a death world. And people still go and live in this shithole just to search for hidden caches of ancient alien technology. TL. DR Australia on steroid with aliens Lomeo. Call of Duty. Black Ops 3 Homefront. The game. Not the similarly named but unrelated movie. Made in Abyss. It is one of those trap anime manga that fools unsuspecting viewers into watching a cute whimsical Studio Ghibli-esque show filled full of wonder and adventure. What the series won't tell you is the amount of grimdark it would throw at you at the most unsuspecting turn. You want to see cute mo lowly children getting tortured, horribly disfigured, experimented on, brutally killed, discarded and abused made in abyss got your back you want to see a death world so extreme it even kills you when you think of trying to escape made in abyss is completely centered around that you want to see a society run on child labor in which death and injury is so common that a 12 year old knows how to amputate an arm and be unfazed by dead bodies made in abyss is proud to include these you want to see a joseph mengel cosplayer evil daft punk super furry lowly fetishist completely best dad ever as the main villain made in abyss Abyss is a proud sponsor of this you want to have a deep and dark philosophy on how deep one's humanity can go before completely losing it and what counts as truly human before succumbing to the human excess of wants. Needs and pride made in Abyss have plenty to showcase this you want to see what would happen when Laputa's flying castle and Madoka magic are fucked berserk made in Abyss is the end result of their sweaty lust you want to hear absolutely beautiful music and see eye poppingly gorgeous art which is contrasted against the raw. Brutal and savage realities of the setting made in Abyss would win over you. You want to get emotionally attached to a bunch of mo furries and cry manly tears without feeling too dirty, don't worry. We in TG can tolerate it. Just about. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. A manga anime film made by Heiei Miyazaki. Yes you heard us right. The man who was the main founder of Studio Ghibli and gave us childhood gems such as Tortoro, Spirited Away and Ponayo. Gave us a science fantasy epic of the brutality of war. Sure there was Princess Mononoke, but that was basically a spiritual sequel to Nausicaa. The setting of Nausicaa is centered around a post-apocalyptic death world in which humanity had nuked itself back into the early renaissance via kilometer tall. 
biomechanical, nuclear firing god warriors. Most children don't make it to adulthood and the remaining human civilizations are on the verge of collapse due to scarcity of resources and the ever-growing encroachment of the sea of death corruption. A forest of highly toxic fungal jungles and incredibly violent mega insects that goes completely anal if you dare pluck a shroom or two. To make matters worse, the state of technology has been declining over the years either due to loss of knowledge or the sheer amount of dead children failing to reach the proper age to spread such knowledge. Nausicaa, especially the manga, does not shy away from human slavery, biological WMDS, genocides, nuclear holocaust. A gratuitous amount of inferred and overt infanticides, inquisitorial purging and the likes. By far the most mature and grittiest of Miyazaki's works. The one main thing that Nausicaa stands out from the rest is its titular character. Princess Nausicaa is an actual pacifist and a self-imposed Jesus archetype. Yet despite such noble bright characteristics, she is an absolute badass. Nausicaa may hate fighting and war. But she is not afraid to split some heads open and gut your belly empty. She is also a surrogate mother for a giant walking WMD and a surrogate big sister for a psychic boy with the assets to boot. This gives her extra brownie points for being awesome. Seriously, the reader and other princesses has nothing on this chick. Because of the fact that Nausicaa for all intents and purposes kickstarted the foundation of Studio Ghibli in the first place. Its influence had a profound impact on Ghibli's future works. It basically was the progenitor of every Ghibli trope imaginable. You got the strong female heroine and her equally strong and capable male deuteragonist check. A setting based upon fantastical elements and a blatant anti-war pro-environmentalist message check. Giant. Awesome planes check. Scenery populated by eye candy artwork check. A quirky. Animal side character check. The bad guys being revealed to be either not so evil misunderstood have morally gray beliefs check. Furthermore, Nausicaa influenced other works such as the Chocobus from Final Fantasy being a complete copy of Nausicaa's horse claws, as well as the God Warriors being the main inspiration of the Mythurficking Evus. Seriously, the main creator behind Evangelion first got the idea after animating the God Warriors for Nausicaa. Seriously look it up, the resemblance is uncanny. Another Studio Ghibli film called Grave of the Fireflies is far worse. The plot of film is a pair of orphans starved to death in Japan at the end of World War II that is the entire plot. This movie utter torture to watch and a great reminder of why war may be fun in games but is the worst thing imaginable in real life. Synthesize. When robots are gods, killing humans is fair game. In the deep darkness of the far post-mutagen virus future, human life is worthless. Murder and theft against them and each other is entirely legal. Murder of sentient bots, who are given free range to torment humans with impunity after being let go from service to the major faction that makes them. However is one of the greatest offenses, and one the PCs are bound to commit at some point in their careers. Also, everything has a black and white color palette. Destiny Destiny 2's backstory. Basically, there was a very short-lived race of people called the Krill which lived only 10 years on a planet called Fundament. Fair note, Fundament is a gas giant, and Jupiter's orbit takes 10 years. So the Krill may have lived to a few hundred. There was a ruler called the Osmium King, and a traitor named Taox killed him. His daughters, Eleven Row, Orash, and Sathona took a ship to the planet's core where they met the worm gods, or Ahamkara. What happened is that the worm gods grant immortality, but in order to become immortal you have to kill or the worm will eat you. This was called the sword logic, and the krill were renamed the hive after killing that fucking traitor Taox. They proceeded to exterminate every living thing in the galaxy, harboring xenophobia and militarism which would make the Imperium look tolerant and pacifist in comparison the aftermath of Avengers. Infinity War. After the battle dust settles, no one really wins at the end of the movie. Even the villain, who won, was badly injured and the victory was very costly. Spec Ops, the line, due to disguising itself as a run-of-the-mill shooter, but disregard for orders and going in all guns blazing in quest of becoming a hero and saving everyone. Unlike most FPS, rather realistically leads from bad to worse. 
resulting in the player committing vile acts and outright war crimes. At the time of its release, its atmosphere and presentation made it a standout. Due to being heavily reliant on the player having no foreknowledge that it'll drown them face first in the horrors of war, the game has undergone a sort of rosebud effect, and at worst can be considered grim burp. Granted, even then it's far less so than the examples below, and can be considered a period piece of sorts whose themes retain relevance. The suffering and the suffering ties that bind. Two messed up stories about an unwell guy who may or may not have murdered his family tries to survive the worst prison in all of Maryland while it's being infested by nightmarish creatures symbolic of the countless atrocities committed on it, being not only a prison but also the former site of a World War II POW camp run by a paranoid lunatic. An old Timmy mental institution run by an eccentric who still haunts the place, and a Puritan village that saw its own recreation of the Salem witch hunts. The sequel sees a man in equally worse surroundings as Baltimore has its own infestation of the monsters symbolic of the city's corruption and is now haunted not only by two deranged murderers, but also a figure from his past who supposedly know the truth about his family. In Ties That Bind, it's implied that every city of decent size has the potential to be turned into a haunted hellscape because humans are shitty and have been doing shitty things to each other for all of recorded history, and hence every city has a number of blood-soaked ghosts created by atrocities and desperate for vengeance. The first two seasons of Animals of Farthing Wood, an animated series for kids infamous for having graphic depictions of violence and a death rate of major characters on par with Game of Thrones. Though somewhat at the low end of the grimdark spectrum, the fact this show was for kids earns it major points for being grimdark. The third series noticeably toned down on the grimdark elements and ended up being the least well regarded. Notable deaths in the series include but are not limited to the pheasants, a couple of well, pheasants who die at a farm in an extremely cruel manner. First, the wife is forced by her husband to take his watch and is spotted by the farmer, then shot. The husband, overcome with grief, elects to go back and find Ada, hoping to atone for causing his wife's death. Instead, he sees a cooked corpse of his wife and breaks down in tears unable to pull himself together and is also shot dead by the farmer. Three baby mice are born in one episode. The very next episode they are all killed on screen by a shrike, a bird infamous for impaling its prey, as seen here. The hedgehogs, while trying to cross a road, have to fight not to curl up into a ball, but eventually, the husband goes crazy, unable to stop himself from curling up, and his wife elects to stay with him, leading to both their deaths when a lorry runs them over. Arva's Demon, a webcomic whose cutesy style doesn't hide how fucking dark this world can be. For starters, in the opening itself, a planet is destroyed by silent scavengers which are Tyranids and Necrons mixed together. Then the main character ends up impaled when they crash land, her soul going to turn into space dust until she agrees to help the demon who's been possessing her since she was born to get revenge on Titan, who can at best be described as the God Emperor if he were every negative stereotype about the Imperium taken to the extreme and then some. How bad is Titan it's implied he turned a star into a black hole solely because of its planet's inhabitants wouldn't do what he wants. And Trust us. Things can only get worse in this setting. Dragon Ball Z. History of Trunks. Could just be expanded to Trunks timeline in general. Dragon Ball has always been known as a sort of noble bright anime. But this, damn. Everyone is either dead, dying, or living in fear of two walking machines of pure evil. And then when Trunks does actually take care of his enemies. Another more powerful one shows up and just sends everything back to the way it was. Even the parody of this movie is oddly depressing. Power Rangers RPM plays with this trope being what is effectively Terminator meets Mad Max for kids, it is still Power Rangers, and does still have its fair share of comic relief. But this is also the season where a young girl is brainwashed into becoming a child soldier for Skynet and HAL 9000's demented love child while also having her humanity stripped away and replaced with cold metal. That's not even starting to mention the fact that most of the planet is wiped out, with billions dying over the course of what seems like a few weeks. Postal, not the sequels, which play the violence for laughs and topical humor, or the crap you bowl movie, 
Just the first game and it's remake. Postal Redux. Once you get past all the shock and outrage of being a forefather of the banned violent video games movement, you'll realize that this game is genuinely fucked up with its imagery and the protagonist is a mentally unwell individual. Resistance. Fall of Man. Romero's Dead series. Especially the later entries. Night is grim for the heroes, even if the overall story ends somewhat happily with the zombies taken care of. On the other hand, dawn and day are much darker, with zombies overrunning society, and though both end on positive notes, the journey there is a grim fight for survival. Most of the heroes die in dawn, all of them if you count the depressing alternate cut, and in day most of the characters, even the heroes, are hateful unhinged, and or just plain crazy. Requiem for a Dream. If you have seen this movie, this is self-explanatory. Blake's 7. The BBC broadcast this against Coronation Street, and it was written by Terry Nation. It opens with a show trial after the hero gets set up to join a terrorist cell post mind wipe, gets accuses of pedophilia, and then exiled to the world of Warhammer where Brian Blessed is king of the cult of Scientology. Then you get four seasons of basically terrorists fighting the evil space empire. With the world's most sarcastic computer, special effects that make your mates laugh when they were 14 years old look high budget. FFS the Federation are armed with corking guns and some pipe. It's fucking glorious. The Promised Neverland. An anime manga about a bunch of cute children raised in a nice orphanage that is really a farm set up by demons who raise the children as food. Hence the Neverland part of the title. The children don't grow up because they are killed by monsters. A handful girls get to survive until adulthood by getting selected to act as mothers to children, but they are still prisoners who can't leave the farm. If they are unlucky they will have to watch over their own children until the day they are killed. The world outside the farms is even worse. A thousand years ago the world was divided between humans and demons. The children are in the demons half. Demons used to hunt humans until the two sides made a truce where the world was divided in two halves to keep peace and humans were handed over to the demons to farm as food and the wealthy family of humans who made the deal are out out to kill the escaped children to uphold it. Demons actually need to eat humans or they degenerate into mindless animals that attack everything in sight. Except of the demon nobility thanks to them consuming blood that remove the need. And they still insist on hoarding the best quality human meat for themselves while leaving the commoners to feed on meat from humans raised on factory farms where the humans are force fed until they die. This inferior quality meat isn't enough to keep demons from degrading and so the demons human allies are doing horrifying experiments to produce better quality meat. Something could have been avoided if the demon nobility didn't make sure that only they were free from dependence on human meat as means of maintaining their control with their supply of meat. Because as you can probably tell, they don't care about the commoners. Dora Hadoro, described by its own author as a song with really dark lyrics, but a melody that's so happy that you want to dance to it. So happy grimduck the title can literally be translated as from shit to shit. Seriously. The setting wouldn't look out of place among a 40k underhive. The entire setting is a massive slum, with horrible pollution, mass poverty, and human body parts polluting the waterways. Your options for living are being a normal human, living in poverty and treated like toys, lab rats, and livestock by the various magic users. Or being a magic user and either be lynched by the terrified normies or captured by other magic users and boiled down to make drugs. And if you're a magic user, regardless of how good you are when you die you're guaranteed to be sent to hell to be tortured by devils for all eternity. Unless you become a devil yourself. Or being a devil and worry about being screwed over by your boss for shits and giggles or eaten by store who is implied to be an angel and treats devils the same way devils treat mortals or being said boss and dick around with people for all eternity because you're absolutely bored with existence can't die and are horribly lonely since you can't form a meaningful bond with anyone else of course your options being metaphorical in this sense since you are either born a normal human or magic user and can't change who you are, 
which is a major plot point for several characters. Three of the most moral people in the entire setting are a mob boss and two different flavors of serial killer. Even when the normal people manage to fight back by creating a god through the merger of thousands of souls of those killed by magic users. It immediately tries to kill everyone just to end its suffering. The only time the weather changes in the series is when it rains, which causes magic users to fall sick because it's the manifestation of the will of said god and if you're a magic user it hates you. Well, at least the food is good. Lobotomy Court Library of Runaraka Project Moon Setting Warframe's Law. What's so dark about Warframe you're a space ninja which just chops stuff up and shoots right or you're dead wrong. The main characters, the Tenno, are children survivors of an accident when a ship tried to use a metaphysical realm called the Void to perform a faster than light jump to TAU-30, which was previously terraformed for their arrival. And what do we know about using metaphysical realms to travel faster than light it goes fuckingly bad. Invest in a warp drive. The Tenno were discovered by the Orokin. Pansy hedonistic little faggots which sent them there and were treated like absolute shit. To get an idea of just how awful the Orokin were, imagine the repressiveness, feudal structures, and lack of regard for human life found in the Imperium of Man, with a tech level comparable to the Dark Age of Technology. The only person who treated the Tenno with absolute respect was a scientist called Margulis. When the robot sent to terraform TAU-30, the sentience, evolved intelligence and came back to anally rape the Orokin. Their built-in weakness was void stuff, which the Tenno were full of. After a victory over the sentience, the Tenno bitch slapped the Orokin and bludgeoned them like the fucks they are. The Orokin are just a bunch of shitbags in general. They treated Tenno, Lorist healers, and Grenier like absolute shit until they need their help. They execute scientists when they fail to produce results. Because a great way of increasing productivity is executing a scientist who is doing the work. And the way they maintain their immortality is by capturing children and mind raping them to download their own consciousness into theirs. The reason that they couldn't control the warframes and needed the Tenno to do so is because they lack basic human empathy. They just abuse and torture everyone under them. The Grenier were slaves to the Orokin which are now free and are now absolutely terrorizing the system. They're a bunch of rotten clones which are highly augmented, and they kill everyone who isn't them, which aren't any better. Oh, and dialogue implies that they process their dead into corpses stark. The corpus are the second faction, being greedy money grubbers who care only for profit, and imprison a colony of dead bondage slaves called Fortuna, just to rub it in, and so on. Oh, and said Solaris are people whose heads have been stuffed into their torsos so they can easily repose as their limbs and organs for depth that is passed through the generations. Oh, and ya not able to pay with your limbs alone they will scoop your brain out of your skull and shelve it for a set amount of time. All the rest of your natural lifespan as you are awake and lost in your thoughts. And, of course, this is done to kids severing their necks and replacing them with a connector to more easily stuff their heads into their scooped out torsos once they are old enough to lug around a wrench. Pretty much all post in civilizations are pieces of shit. And if evil bureaucrats and shitty clones who want to kill everything that isn't them bad enough, we have the infected, which are a hive mind of twisted forms that kill everything they can stick their bloody tendrils into. Bottom line is, Warframe is a shitty place. Unhallowed Metropolis, a game representing probably the outer limits of how grimdark you can go without sliding into grimderp. Fragged Cyberpunk, a prequel to the more optimistic Fragged Empire. Fragged Cyberpunk focuses on the twilight years of humanity as Habsburg and levels of genetic erosion and degradation leave it only a few centuries of life, while the powers that be that could cure it do not bother and instead focus their efforts on terraforming hospitable worlds for their new, engineered super species. All the while herding humans into cramped cities on dead planets that are effectively concentration death camps for what remains of mankind. Clive Barker in general. His works include Hellraiser, Rawhead Rex where an ancient god of male sex eats kids, the Midnight Meat Train where an ancient cult feeds people to an underground society of monsters so New York isn't destroyed. 
And let's just say there's a reason he's basically a BDSM enthusiast given way too much handle. I, Divine Sibamancy, basically, WH40K with French people, Half-Life, a video game series which helped revolutionize FPS games, has a surprisingly dark story and lore. In the first game, you play as Gordon Freeman and defeat an invading alien race after an accident you helped indirectly cause. Then comes the second game, where it turns out the alien boss you killed in the last game was keeping the Combine at bay. A race of interdimensional conquerors who bulldoze Earth in a matter of hours and occupy it, running the planet's resources dry and slowly driving mankind to extinction while irreparable damage is done to the ecosystem. With a steadily losing resistance and Gordon's old boss overseeing everything the Combine does, you come back and help turn the tide in the fight. But throughout all this, guiding your every action, is a G-Man. An enigmatic figure with cinch levels of planning and manipulation. Ultimately, every action you take is for his benefit. You cannot make any real choice because he will make it for you. In other words, no matter what Gordon or anyone else does, the G-Man will always be right there, waiting in the wings to slightly adjust it to his benefit. And there's almost nothing that can be done to stop him. Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy a book following the exploits of the Glanton Gang, a real-life group of scalpers in the 19th century. The book is infamous for its casual depiction of brutal violence but also dwells on some philosophical themes with dark implications, such as free will, God, life, and war. Most of the book's worst scenes involve the mysterious Judge Holden, who has an almost fanatical reverence for war and also is implied to regularly rape children. All while being disturbingly educated and displaying seemingly mystical abilities. The ending heavily hints Holden may not be human even and represents something that will never die. With seemingly little hope for mankind. Grimdark why don't people band together to fix things because Grimdark? Why hasn't an external system supplanted the current barely functioning one because Grimdark? How does such a woefully inefficient system manage the logistical nightmare of endless total war because I murdered a baby seal? That's why you should feel bad. Terrible writing advice. The Grimdark episode. Grimdark is what happens when a writer takes Grimdark so far that it goes derp. The writer puts something in that makes the setting more Grimdark, but it's generally reliant on at least one party involved suddenly abandoning all sense of reason and logic, or else caused by a lack of forethought on the implications of how the element interacts with the world. Many long runner Grimdark works will become this sooner or later. As either the setting or the cast's morality, rather a usually extreme lack thereof, will induce complete and utter apathy in the audience and cause them to give up out of sheer pointlessness. Most dark anime manga tend to be more or less grim derp, as attempts to attract mature audiences ends in violence, blood, and sex without consequence, at best, mind you, at worst, all in gratuitous quantities. To be clear. Grimdark is not just that something is dark or that a character behaves stupidly. Human beings make dumb, short-sighted, irrational, and morally objectionable decisions all the time. Just crack open about any book on human history. Grimdark is when a character breaks character to do something they would normally never do or engage in behavior that is logistically impossible. There are as many elves as the plot demands, simply because it's dark. To put it in another way. It is basically the author, S, writing dark things for the sake of edginess. The end product often comes out as painfully juvenile and sounding like something out of a 13 year old fanfic that thinks adding barbed wire coated in fesses to everything makes something deep. That is not to say it is impossible to make an absurdly dark fiction without straying off course into grimdark territory. The post-apocalyptic short story. I have no mouth and I must scream by Harlan Ellison avoids the grim derp label due to the historical context the story was written in as well as the philosophical debate on the idea of cruelty as presented through am. Is am a spiteful, cruel monster or a product of man's penchant for violence and warfare trapped in its own database prison? Another example that avoids this title would be Stephen Baxter's Ely Sequence whose entire ethos is a critique and ruthless deconstruction on the entire humanity fuck you air and cosmic horror tropes whilst still crafting an unbelievably depressing multiverse. So yes, 
It is possible to write pure concentrated grimdark but it should be done with a level of delicacy and self-awareness for it to be seen as legible. The Last of Us, Part 2, the sequel to the critically acclaimed The Last of Us, is grimmed up in its purest form, characters prolong suffering simply out of the blue. Basic logic is thrown out as countless characters dive headfirst into a rabbit hole of violence, suffering and oppression often to the point of literal edginess the dothraki of a song of ice and fire we are asked to believe that an entire culture can sustain itself by raiding settled people when the mongols and plains indians they are based on hunted and herded large animals while not selling or eating the livestock they plunder eating horses whenever possible despite borderline worshipping them and relying on them as beasts of burden or war steeds solve literally all their disputes with murder and defeat their enemies with mass charges despite real nomads having small populations and winning battles with cavalry skill and or surprise at the point where the story says that a wedding without at least three deaths is considered a dull occasion and mentions warriors casually raping dancers the first fight to the death started over two warriors wanting the same dancer the whole thing just looks like an edgy magical realm based on hordes of eastern savages cliches. Fallout Equestria Project Horizons is a fan fiction about magical ponies so grim, dark, and derp that it would almost be comical if it wasn't so fucking horrifying. With characters that get shit on, both figuratively and literally, more than the lamenters, and with a world so bleak, missing the point of Fallout Fim and the original Fallout, Equestria, that becoming an hero would actually be the happiest ending. It's a prime example of how to make readers stop giving a fuck about the story at all. On that note, 90% of all grimdark fics are grimdark since writers are under the impression that just making things dark makes it good writing. There are exceptions, but they are rare because Sturgeon's Law is a thing. On the flip side, however, Certain examples have reached the apotheosis of Grimderp and become gut-bustingly hilarious. Warhammer 40,000 gets called out as this by some. Certainly it's a valid criticism of certain parts, but as we said earlier, you could argue about what is and is not Grimderp in 40k for weeks without conclusion. For example, the Imperium is excessively self-destructive and tyrannical to its own people, but in the hands of a good writer. It's meant to underline how corrupt and desperate the Imperium has become without the Emperor's guidance, and how even those who are neither incompetent nor malicious still have to make brutally difficult choices. In the hands of a lesser writer, it's unnecessary evil purely for the sake of evil. We should call our next book Darkness of Darkest Dark Historically, The Grail Myths Drift, not from Christian sources, but Celtic ones, and beyond the Celts, older civilizations. And a typical feature of these myths happens to be the healing of a king through forces of restoration and regeneration. That is, to put one in touch with his sources, with his roots. And the king was typically seen in agrarian societies as the king of a land, a vatterer of a sky father, and the queen as the earth goddess. The geokinesis psychic discipline has a power called earth blood who would do just that. If only someone let librarians enter the imperial palace to do some Percival style healing. Cornet knights, the grey knights, who seem to get this a lot, really, equipment and how it is made. Specifically, every bolt shell that the grey knights use is consecrated by the blood sacrifice of a righteous man or woman in a borderline cornet ritual, and it has to be a good person, not just anyone. How the Imperium determines if someone is sufficiently good or not remains an open question. Those Aegis armors made from thousands of sickers, including children, burned alive in a furnace to channel their power to the armor. Thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people have to die to make one Grey Knight combat effective. This has caused a lot of scub as to whether it is grim derp or not as it raises the question of where the Grey Knights find enough good people to consecrate all of the Bolt rounds they go through every battle, especially in the 42nd millennium, considering the monstrous spike in chaos activity post-rift. Geller fields being powered by the dreams of a comatose sick are being used as a battery, which also burns out and has to be replaced regularly. While very dark, it crosses the line into grim derp when one realizes one, that Geller fields were said to be invented long before sickers began appearing among humanity, and two, 
Sickers are apparently rare enough in the Imperium that the Imperium has an entire institution dedicated to rounding up Sickers and bringing them back to Terra to make use of them. Like making Astropaths or feeding the Astronomicon and the Golden Throne. And according to recent editions the black ships are just barely meeting the quota to keep the Golden Throne going. So it's not like there are a lot of spare Sickers around to be made into Geller Field batteries. Originally. The Black Templars were treated as refusing to suffer the witch no matter who they were, to the point of refusing to ally with any Imperial institution that made use of them. This got retconned to only hate enemy Sickers in 6th edition after it was pointed out it would be really hard for the Black Templars to do anything if they refused to tolerate astropaths or navigators, and thus have no warp travel or faster than light communication. Agri worlds. Seemingly in response to the common fandom sentiment that most worlds in the Imperium are actually quite decent places to live, just so long as you don't get invaded by orcs. Chris Rate in Lords of Silence outlines a typical agri world, describing a horrific hellscape racked by permanent dust bowl conditions and so much pesticides that the sky turns orange and it is not safe to walk around outside without a biohazard suit and goes on to say that all agri worlds are like this. This has caused a lot of scub within the community. Some say that this practice is perfectly acceptable grimdark, and that unsustainable farming practices aren't exactly unusual in human history. Look at slash and burn farming practices in Brazil, or aquifer use in the United States. However, what people find issue with is the claim that all agri worlds are invariably like this. When the fact that conditions on various planets in the Imperium vary massively from world to world as needed for the plot and there is almost no standardization has always been considered one of the big selling points of the setting. Not to mention contradicting descriptions of Agri Worlds and Cyphus Kane in The Last Chances. The other aspect that people tend to find unbelievable is that the Imperium is claimed to not even use crop rotation in their Agri Worlds simply farming the same crop over and over again until the soil gives out and the planet becomes a death world. The Imperium may have lost a lot of its ancient knowledge, but crop rotation as a practice goes back to the freaking Stone Age. It's absurd to see knowledge that basic being lost in the horrors of old night, or not been rediscovered in the time after. This also means the Imperium would literally have run out of planets thousands of years ago if this was true. The nature of how Imperial ships work has caused a great deal of scub. Namely the fact that the weapons of Imperial ships are loaded by hundreds of Chen bulks, rabid slaves dragging them into place while being whipped. The exertion being so great that many die frothing at the mouth by the effort or have their hands crushed by chains. They do this completely by hand, hauling the munitions across the ship with chains. This despite the fact that hydraulic power systems have existed since the 18th century. They don't even use inclined planes or levers. Something which humanity has been using to haul large objects where they want them to go since the days of Stonehenge. The pyramids and Easter Island. Or they could literally just use a chimera or a team of grogs to do the job. You know, the reason why humanity built large vehicles and domesticated large animals meanwhile the Adeptus Mechanicus is using autoloaders, and is deliberately go keeping the technology from the rest of the Imperium so they will have an advantage in case another civil war ever breaks out. Some say this is perfectly acceptable grimdark. Others say that this is just too ridiculously inefficient to take seriously, even for the Imperium. The Marnius Kalga comic has caused a shitstorm with the recent revelations that the average life expectancy of the best place in the Imperium is in the mid-30s, which is fucking stupid. Because that means that the life expectancy of other non-Ultramire worlds are drastically shorter, which makes the machinations on how the Imperium is run fucking unsustainable. If child mortality rates are that high, then entire worlds would have quite literally run out of humans especially in war zones, while entire sectors worth of economies would collapse or stagnate as more kids die before they grow up and be a productive member of society. This creates a drain in resources and long term stability. It was already considered unsustainable during medieval times. So you could just extrapolate this to a million worlds and the Imperium should collapse under its own inertia and wait by this point. I don't care how disposable human life is, 
It is still a resource and the Emperor fucking hates wasting resources. We get that the comic writer is trying to shoehorn even more feudalist themes in the comics. But the problem is, this is not Krieg we're talking about, but fucking Ultramar. So either the author does not know what sense of scale is, or that he does not understand the works of Gilliman because Grandpa Smurf would not let this shit fly under the radar. The author has confirmed, however, that it was added to make Ultramar feel more grimdark. To give you some context, Somalia in the mid-1960s has a higher life expectancy than this. This is not grimdark. This is just fucking stupid that breaks the suspension of disbelief. It is one of the few things that both 4chan and Reddit concurrently agree upon as fluff breaking. To be honest, the whole idea of humans being the teeming multitudes faction winning battles by sheer weight of numbers and which breed quickly and are easily replaced is kind of silly if you know anything about human reproduction. Among species on earth, humans are notable for being one of the slowest reproducing species out there. It takes 9 months for a human to gestate a maturity in the womb, more than any other animal aside from elephants and whales. And even after birth humans take longer to reach maturity even compared to our close relatives the Neanderthals and Homo erectus. Additionally, it takes a huge amount of parental care to care for a child and raise them to functional adulthood, more than any other animal. On top of this, pregnancy is incredibly crippling for human females, and women have a 1 in 3 chance of dying in childbirth if giving birth without any external aid or midwives as would be the case for a citizen of the underhives, something almost no other species has to deal with. The way our species generally works is we breed incredibly slowly but live an incredibly long time and invest a lot of resources to make sure those few that are born survive to adulthood, which basically makes us the elves of the animal kingdom. Barring some major technological breakthrough like artificial wombs or genetic engineering to reduce the crippling side effects of human pregnancy or long adolescence, humans are unlikely to be able to outbreed anything. And while some factions in the Imperium do have access to artificial wombs, like the Mechanicus, most of humanity in 40k are shown to still reproducing the old fashioned way. Even if humanity starts out with a huge population it can throw at any problem. That population is going to be depleted pretty fast because humanity can't replace their losses. Even if are the greatest resource the Imperium has, they are still trying to fight a war of attrition against foes including ones who can't even be properly killed and two races who can easily outbreed humanity. One reproduces by fighting and the other are a rapidly reproducing horde of space locusts who go from conception to combat ready within a Terran week. However, fans tend to ignore this because of the whole to be a man in such times as to be one among stunt old billions thing that is part of the general lack of regard for human life that makes 40k 40k. So people give it a pass. Some 40k sources claim that millions if not billions of guardsmen are killed every second. Even with the scale of the Imperium taken into the account. Having many times the current population of the Earth die every minute would be ridiculous for the whole of Imperium. Let alone just the Imperial Guard. Watch Captain Artemis saying better to let the galaxy burn and allow the Imperium to fall to chaos than allow the Xenos to live right before fucking up an elder ritual that would have awakened in it early and fucked over Slanesh, indirectly causing all of the ruckus of 8th edition. Granted, while this does come from the Death Watch, who tend to be rabidly anti-Xenos even by the Imperium's standards, this is for chaos, the archenemy, the big bad evil guy of the Warhammer 40k setting, the one faction that even the notoriously xenophobic Imperium will begrudgingly admit is a bigger threat than the Xenos and will team up with them to fight against it. A loyalist saying they prefer chaos over anything, even as the lesser of two evils, should be grounds for an insta-blaming and a red flag for chaos corruption. And no, watch Captain Artemis was not Balamed for this. Nor is this treated as the beginnings of his corruption and a slow fall to chaos. And so a loyalist space marine managed to single-handedly save Slanesh. Seriously, chaos champions have been elevated to demon princehood for less. The whole thing reached the lowest point by 3rd edition. Considered the darker and edgier version of 40k. This is when some of the silliest things mentioned in this wiki were added or accentuated. After that 40k required more than 5 editions of fluff update, novels, 
characters and additional background to finally come back from we no longer care to an actual war with stakes and actual chances for all sides involved. Star Wars. Although Star Wars is 40k's high fantasy twin, they have been a few grim derp things that came out recently in canon that has given 40k a run for its money. According to canon, specifically the novel Ashoka, the Galactic Empire forces farming worlds by gunpoint to harvest a particular breed of crop to be used as rations for their troops. The problem these crops were specifically designed to soak up every bit of nutrients on the planet until it becomes sterile. Meaning that the particular farming world is only capable of harvesting the crops a few times at best before it becomes a sterile death world. Let's put this in context here. The Galactic Empire is currently fighting a galaxy-wide insurgency and being a galaxy-wide government, the gen needs a sustainable way to produce food in order to keep its giant military well-fed for long-term campaigns. So forcing farming worlds to produce crops that intentionally leave their worlds sterile after a few farming cycles is just fucking stupid. Because realistically, the gen would have quite literally ran out of food in a decade, collapsing due to galaxy-wide famine. This shit is so fucking stupid and retarded that it makes the above-mentioned I'm Agri world farming practices look eco-friendly in comparison. Even if they did something somewhat reasonable like restricting this practice to worlds that sided with the Confederacy of Independent Systems during the Clone Wars as a punishment, it's just spiteful beyond all reason. Seriously. This is a level of grim derp surpassing the U.S. and Vaughn. Sure, they will be a race of machine-hating, masochistic religious zealots, but even they had organic technology to compensate. Some were capable of pragmatism and they didn't make unsustainable food sources. And this is before they overhauled their society. Drow Tales. The whole series is grim derp on steroids, but there are a few particularly nauseating examples. Nothing like the protagonist Mary Sue of innocence and purity blowing up the light elf milf slave called Meyer in an argument with a rival. An argument in which he feels morally justified right after buying a fighting slave which was doomed to die in underground arenas even most Drow find disgusting, ran by a complete monster of a dro, regularly visited to watch slaves die. That's right by the protagonist Ariel. Maya dies crying in her native tongue about what she did to deserve this, crying she'll never see sunlight again. Protagonist feels a bit bad about a few days, and only that when she sees a few naked light elf slaves for sale, reminiscing Maya's face. Years pass and she thinks all the slavery and needless murder isn't so cool. Just before visiting a surface colony who was taken from humans, she and her lesbian lover have an orgy on the settlement they just conquered by massacre. After a blissful after sex sleep, the settlement is counterattacked by desperate humans coming to save their kin, which are promptly murdered by the half-light half-dark elf paladin of Sharis. Yes. And Mary Sue worshipping a total Baldur's Gate ripoff who is all high and righteous when she is burning innocent humans who wanted to save their kin from slave traders about to buy the survivors. The protagonist lesbian empath Dro, yes, with a length of purple hair paint, straight out of Deviantet, friend berates the cornered humans with a lame excuse line of I feel your pain. Why don't you take your survivors and run when the said humans scream in desperation to save their families from the town's locked buildings, die horribly and our I'm glad my clan sagris prevents slavery. Let's shake hands and feast on the food we just plundered protagonist shakes hands on it. It's not even depressing. It's plain fucking logic diarrhea with enough depressive themes to odd an edgy 13 year old. Considering the authors were that old when they started, Jeff Loeb's run on Ultimate Marvel. People dying brutally. Most well known being Wasp getting eaten by the blob. And completely gratuitously. DR. Strange is killed the one page he shows up on and is completely forgotten afterwards. Law rape worse than anything Ward ever did. The heroic Pyro is now a rapist version of the mainline Marvel Pyro with no explanation. Thor going from new age hippie to mainline style viking with no explanation. At least that last one is kinda cool. Overall it was so bad it effectively made the ultimate Marvel universe. With the exception of Spider-Man and his cast, 
completely unusable. Small wonder that years later, Marvel thought smashing it and the main Marvel Universe together would be a good idea. Jeff had lost his 17 year old son to cancer not long before and apparently was taking his sorrow and anger out on the Ultiverse. It's no excuse, I suppose, but it is actually kind of sad. Kaltetsu Jano Kabanari an anime with a similar premise to the already grimdark Attack on Titan. It's set in, presumably feudal, Japan, where people are hiding behind walls and communicate with each other's using trains to travel from town to town, and trades the giants and horses for guns and zombies. Several of the characters have moments of team killing and aptitude that end up prolonging the conflict far longer than it should. The samurai don't bother with armor and generally aren't very combat savvy when it comes to zombies, and their lawful stupid tendencies turn any defense against a wall breach into an utter clusterfuck. The antagonist is an absolute failure and wanted for crimes against humanity, being a pretentious Che Guevara wannabe with pink hair and wielder of an ugly yet somewhat effective saber. He also has a devoted following despite being thoroughly unable to grasp the basics of warfare and its ethics. He thinks children are cowards for not being able to fight monsters at ambush and run through trained adult fighters with ease and considers destroying one's own resources and castles to be a viable strategy. Meanwhile, the main protagonist has found not one, but two miracle solutions that would allow mankind to fight back against the zombie plague. But no one will listen to him, especially not the main antagonist, both because of the above and because of course they wouldn't. It's grimdark grimdark. Ironically, Ancient Shintoism, a main religion of that period, has the only known anti-zombie deities, Kyukiri Haim no Kami, a goddess of purification. Despite being rather sadomasochist, whose followers would bind a corpse with ropes, place a big stone on the chest and bury it. Coffins are optional. Insane as it was, it was the most common form of burial in the Jomon period and never went completely out of date through all the medieval period. Despite the rites being a perfect defense against an undead invasion, apparently they didn't take in this setting. Three guesses why. Most dark fantasy Ryona Hente like Reedy of Ahila, see edgy for details. Kiroino, Maggot Bates and whatever bargain basement Hente game developer puts their heroines through horrifying rapes, tortures and debauchery with no way to escape. All for little more purposes than to degrade, humiliate and mind break them. Fatal. Black Tokyo about half of Garth Ennis's work goes so far around the bend that, if you don't stop caring about anyone in the story and put it down first, it becomes compelling or hilarious. Practically all of his original stories are drowning in grim dirt and author axe grinding. Prime examples include, The Boys. Almost every superhero is an irredeemable sexual deviant and loose cannon whose only crime-fighting accomplishments come from corporate PR lies, and the story's protagonists a little better. Surprisingly averted for the most part with its Amazon Prime adaptation. By actually making most of the heroes less unambiguously rotten, cutting down the childish silliness, making the violence less gratuitous and more justified, and making the boys themselves more human. The series actually manages to be way darker than the comics. Hell, Billy Butcher actually contemplates murdering a child in the series, which is something the way more psychotic Butcher of the comics would not. On the other hand, Homelander was made worse. Homelander's worst atrocities from the comics were actually done by Black Noir who was gaslighting him. While Homelander in the series really did those things and Black Noir has another story. Preacher. One of his most infamous works, an edgelord power fantasy against all Christianity, including especially God. It revolves around a former priest with a mysterious power, his criminal ex and a heroin addicted vampire. Even worse in the Amazon Prime adaptation, the salvageable parts of the plot were swapped out for even more edgelordery. A prime example is dinosaurs being extinct because God killed them all when one did something gross. Crossed. Another of his most infamous creations. Most of the world is dead or turned into murder raping sadists a acute lather reavers from firefly due to a virus with a visible symptom being boils forming a cross pattern on the infectee's face. Showing any courage will get you killed or turned into one of the aforementioned murder rapists. And there are survivors that are just as fucked up as the infectees. Supposedly a dig at armchair survivalists. 
it's now mostly remembered for being edgy for the sake of edginess and being overall boring as hell. Hatred. Remember how your family told you that GTA was breeding criminals and that games created monsters well? Hatred tries to cash in on that by making a game dedicated to killing innocent people and making a parody out of those reactions but fails miserably to do that. This is because not only is our main hero a complete arsehole with literally nothing redeeming about him, but most of the gameplay consists on you shooting unarmed civilians and members of the policy military that are easy to beat, and coupled with the monochrome colors the game becomes very boring in a very quick pace. And unlike these old games that caused oh so much controversy, Hatred doesn't even have that good old orcish humor, unlike the video game Postal and tries to take everything inside it seriously, which makes the grimdark aspect come off as very dumb. Cole Sargent's total rape of the Greyhawk setting in from the ashes. This is a unique case in that the grimdark was actually fairly well done. It's that he had to fuck over the game's oldest and most beloved setting by ridconning out. X. The Horned Society. Or altering to the point of demonization. X. Chelene. The Southern Duchess. Anything that disagreed with the new Uber Grimdark direction he wanted it to take that made it Grimdark. Most of the anti-HFY content in the world of darkness, especially the unmitigated misanthropy in parts of Werewolf, the Apocalypse. Humans vary from apathetic fools responsible for most of the world's ills to cackling, moustache twirling villains. Civilization and all its fruits are evil and the tribe of bestiality born werewolves that want to exterminate the human race down to pre-stone age levels are presented as heroes that re unequivocally morally justified in their actions both in and out of setting. Yeah. Anything made by biggest hack in Hollywood. Zack Hack Snider. Life Web. A complex SS-13 spin-off taking place in a cave fortress of a neo-medieval world in the far future. Combat is more lethal, and it claims to explore subjects like murder, corruption, rape, with no regard for age, torture, cultism and general human suffering. In reality, the themes it explores just means it's in the game and you can do it and it's a farce on every level possible. The Hearts of Iron I've mod the New Order. Last Days of Europe has numerous dystopian failstats, but the most notorious is the SS Ordenstadt Burgund, also known as Burgundy. Covering northeastern France and Belgium, Burgundy is ruled by Heinrich Himmler and the SS as a giant concentration camp. Its sole purpose is genocide, first on the local and ultimately on the global scale. When it isn't killing its own inhabitants, it's backing SS agents throughout the Third Reich's sphere of influence to further its cause of evil. Economic Minister Oswald Pohl even points out that killing massive swathes of the nation's population just for not being Aryan isn't sustainable, but Himmler regards such criticism as treason. Realistically, Burgundy should have collapsed on itself before the game started, but it can stick around regardless. Playing as it is as difficult and miserable as you'd expect from a Holocaust management sim. What was once Soviet Russia has collapsed into several warlord states, and many of these are grimdark as fuck. Standouts include all Russian Black League of Omsk, a hyper-nationalist warlord state led by revenge-mad ex-Soviet generals determined to launch an no-holds-barred genocidal war against Germany called the Great Trial. Imagine if the death corpse of Krieg ended up in charge of Russia and you have a pretty good idea. Hyperborea which is Russia run by batshit insane neo-pagan Slav supremacists who practice human sacrifice, and the Holy Russian Empire, which honestly deserves its own section. It's so utterly glorious in its grimdark. Russia is unified by an ultra-right-wing Comey government headed by a deranged, self-loathing Jewish antisemite named Sergei Taboritsky who believes that Serovich Alexei miraculously survived the massacre of the Romanovs in 1918 and like a proverbial king under the mountain will come back to rule once Russia is sufficiently purified. To this end, Taboritsky implements esoteric national socialism that is the Burgundian system. An even more extreme ideological offshoot of Nazism emphasizing inflicting horrible state-mandated cruelty on everyone living under it to strengthen the Aryan race, in Russia, creating a theocratic totalitarian dictatorship that purges anyone deemed sufficiently un-Russian with an emphasis on the Jews. To this end Taboritsky deploys copious amounts of chemical weapons against dissidents 
including one named Tabrite that melts people's flesh into slurry on contact to the extent that vast tracts of Russia are ecologically devastated for thousands of years, murdering the mentally ill and disabled children, burning priests at the stake, declaring that the idea of innocence doesn't exist and changing laws so that even dropping your tools at work can get you tried and summarily executed. The kind of shit in a world where Adolf Hitler not only exists but achieved even more of his evil plans to reshape the world than in real life. He is considered a secondary evil to Taboritsky, but eventually Taboritsky has a beautiful vision of Alexei coming back that turns into a vision of a little pile of bones with a bullet hole through the skull. And the old man realizes that Alexei is dead and not coming back and literally dies of despair. This is only the very beginning of Taboritsky's wild ride and subsequent events show the nation's descent into complete insanity that has been affectionately named post taboritsky meet a horror neo warlordism because nobody in their right mind would dare confront or question a man who might strangle you thinking you are Cain. Everyone settles into default orders through sheer fear. Purification squads just keep killing until they lose their minds a la heart of darkness. One soldier is so far gone that he doesn't even recognize his own parents shortly after executing them. Factory workers are made to work themselves to death because the order to let them go home never comes through. Whole towns and swathes of Russia are completely destroyed by the army bombarding them with chemical weapons or abandoned as people begin fleeing west into Nazi Germany just to escape the horror. Eventually the armies, the ministers and even the flag of the Holy Russian Empire disappear. Russia turns into a blackboardless DMZ, and the portrait changes to an unlit abandoned shack in the middle of nowhere and the nation gains the radio silence tray, with only one broadcast leaving the nation's borders, presumably forevermore. Remain calm. The regent endures. Alexei lives. The Holy Russian Empire shall endure. There is much work to be done, apparently according to the developers. What Taboritsky does to Russia is so thorough that it's like the aftermath of a nuclear holocaust and the trauma is so great that Russia will never reunify ever again. The After Midnight update adds a post-Taboritsky epilogue and paints a nightmarish picture of what post-Taboritsky meet a horror neo-warlordism fully entails. After a period of total anarchy where mechanized warbands of radicalized ultranationalist soldiers roam the country killing everyone they encounter. Successor states eventually emerge headed by some of the most deranged and unstable people you can imagine. The Black League of Omsk becomes even more insane, expanding the Great Trial, a project of genocidal war against the Germans. To also include any corrupted Russians not outside their borders. The once persecuted Kazakhs are launching genocidal crusades into Russia to wipe the Russian people from the earth as revenge. A band of Shturmovaki stranded in Omsk and driven mad by the revelation that the head of the Holy Russian Empire was that you have pledged their allegiance to Satan out of despair and madness. Engaging in human sacrifice and inviting nihilistic thugs and serial killers into their ranks. Magadan is a wretched hive of smugglers and ex-fascist thugs. The Eurasian Republic is a megacorp warlord state convinced that explicitly rejects all dreams and ideals beyond sustaining the state. And that Russian national identity is so tainted irrevocably by the HRE that it seeks to create a new Eurasian identity in its place. I could go on. Recent updates have focused more on the derp than the grim. Apparently as a reaction to Burgundy's pre-rework supervillainy. Unlike before, where it could last into the 80s because the plot would break otherwise. New Burgundy experiences not as planned moments on a near fail Baden scale. Himmler shooting Oswald Pohl for his treason not only tanks the economy but also makes economic management impossible. Over time, the slaves, French and Belgian collaborator legions, and even Burgundy's own ministers will eventually get fed up and rebel. If Himmler purges them, literally everyone else will rise up in an event called the Burgundian Spring. Even in the rare event that Himmler actually gets his nuclear holocaust, it ultimately fails. The pure Aryans he chose to preserve emerge from their bunkers and peacefully join post-apocalyptic society without issue. Why Himmler told them that only true Aryans would survive the nuclear holocaust. So they assume that all the survivors are Aryan by definition. Even if said survivors are Jewish or black. Kane and Lynch. 
Dog Days, the first game already bordered on Grim Derp thanks to having two completely villainous outlaws going against others villainous outlaws, but avoided it by having an engaging if edgy plot, but the second game oh boy, it jumps the shark from Grim Vile to Shit Vile, our heroes return, just as horrible as ever, except with the addendum that the game tries to create the most disgusting creepy atmosphere possible, shaky camera in order to portray the protagonist diminishing mental health flares that block your victims blown up parts and others thing done to really showcase violence as disturbing it succeeds while making the game completely unplayable as the shaky camera ends up being vomit inducing the screen being blocked by blood and trash coming off as more obnoxious than anything else and the lack of heroic or even sympathetic motivation from the main characters making it impossible for a player to empathize with the omnicidal maniacs who by the end of the campaign have ruined the lives of hundreds of innocent people just save their own face. Your reward for going through this shit trek a cliffhanger ending that doesn't promise a single good thing out of it. Imagine all the problems mentioned above regarding The Last of Us 2. Swap the zombie apocalypse scenario for a criminal story and slap outdated gameplay and an atmosphere done on purpose to be off-putting in it, and you have a game the player will barely endure a single playthrough, while at the same time not caring for any of the two assholes you are controlling. Or to quote our hate fuck buddy from zero punctuation, much as the visuals succeed too well at being deliberately hideous. The characters succeed too well at being deliberately wankers. There's nothing fun about the game. No light relief. Just one nauseating heap on unpleasantness after another. Like a roadside cafe breakfast special by Jeffrey Dahmer. Yahtzee. Grim tragedy naturally in a universe such as 40k. The grim darkness of the setting would mean nothing if not tied into the ironic tragedy of the lore. This includes a species with so much potential. But so afraid of the dauntless perils of chaos that they will brutally harass and execute entire populations out of mere suspicion. All to stop the spread of ruin while indirectly strengthening those who seek to destroy them. Particularly chaos. They, as a people, have progressed massively in population, technology and power since their species conception. Yet they, more than anyone else, have lost one vital element their humanity. A race who was once at a zenith of civilization and prosperity, capable of bending the very gods to their will, but by their own hand reduced themselves to scattered isolated fleets and colonies always on the run. Their pompous and arrogant leaders hide behind a dwindling sense of security based in superiority over other races who are far more successful and perhaps destined to be greater than they ever were. A number among them, after their unholy and insidious near demise, Continue, with oblivious glee, to empower the very being that brought them to ruin in order to save themselves. A race of creatures who possess the brightest potential, with near mastery over the psychic, near natural physical perfection and almost limitless numbers from their highly successful methods of reproduction. And yet they are genetically restricted by an unquenchable thirst for conflict which drives each to idiocy, leaving them hopeless of advancing beyond simple barbarians. An ancient people who were so envious of their neighbors lifespans that they were ready to cripple the entire galaxy just for the sake of petty superiority. A superiority neutered by their unwitting transformation into metaphorical and literal automatons. They are now mindless machines who, buff you, care nothing of their past and seek only one thing, conquest. And those who still have their personalities are either insane, demented, depressed, brooding, psychotic, or any combination of these in various proportions. A newborn race who innocently believes that there can be peace and acknowledgement among each other. Unfortunately the sinister methods they employ hoping that it is for something better is slowly, but steadily driving them into the decadence that plagues the other species. In doing so they become proof, both of the fact that anyone, no matter their intentions, can be corrupted and also of the kindness that the rest have forsaken for damnation and despair. The fact that, despite tens of thousands of years of knowing nothing but war, these peoples are woefully unprepared for what is to come. No matter how many regiments can be raised or craft worlds restored, what is out there is all-consuming, diabolical and numberless. Unless, they are themselves on the verge of extinction, and as such, 
desperately trying to cross over the great void between galaxies, which implies fighting against invincibles foes and fate dodging cheaters unnaturally empowered by the grief of an unspeakable eldritch abomination beyond the cosmos. The good option is that there are a thousand galaxies worth of the fucking bugs. The bad option is that there are billions upon billions of galaxies worth of the fucking bugs. The worse option is that billions upon billions galaxies worth of what is essentially the perfect organism is running away from something worse.